Well, good afternoon from PAX West. We are back here in person. Trackside getting set for the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Championship Cup 2022. That's right. This is not your grandpappy special cup here. We are getting set to bring you 12 of the top racers, eight courses, one champion. Welcome in. I'm Jordan Kent, and joining me, we have one of the fastest men in the pit stops here, E.E., e., and a man that is no stranger to the checkered flag fair. And E.E., e., let's get started with you. What are you excited to see? We have so much talent on display here today. Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, you know, if you talk to a lot of the players and just some of the fans, you know, like Strike is definitely one of the favorites coming into this to obviously take the whole thing, right? Just a, oh, so much talent we've amassed at this competition. But for me, there is a wild card pick I would like to go with. My man Bowser, he qualified here by winning the PAX Arena. He's won on a stage like this before. He feels very comfortable playing in front of a live crowd and in that kind of environment. I think just seeing how these players adapt, you know, the differences from online to offline is really what's going to be telling about this whole event. And Bear, we're looking at so much skill on display here. Definitely. Where do we find the separation between these 12? Because it's going to be chaotic. So it really depends on every course. But in, the, in reality, you want to make sure that you're have the perfect lines, go as fast as you can. But if you're not, you want to be really strategic with your items. So you're going to have a lot of good item play. People have to have like great course awareness of the mini-map, and then that's going to make or break for a lot of these races. Well, let's buckle our seatbelts and take a look at the rules here today. As we've mentioned, we've got 12 racers, eight courses, one champion. Most points after eight races wins. Seems pretty simple to me. 150 CC. This is the way that we're doing it here. Normal items, all vehicles. Smart steering off. Yes, you have to have your license ready to go here for this one. And let's go ahead and check out these courses. These were selected by the racers, and this will be in a predetermined order after a random draw. You see two courses from each of these four following cups here. And starting with this year, Bear, obviously the courses will play a huge role in the strategy race after race. Yeah, especially given that every single one of these courses are derived from you know, all the retro courses, but the tour courses themselves, I'm very excited because these are all have different variations of their specific Mario Kart tour courses all in one track. And given that a lot of these courses have a uh, great comeback factor, you're definitely going to see some chaotic racing going on. You hear the round of applause for our racers as they get set and EE, -E, obviously it's Mario Kart. Yes. Items play a tremendous role in your success. You can say it isn't 100% skill. You sometimes <laughs> need a little bit of luck. Yep. And there will be some gamemanship going on as far as when these racers decide to get their items. I mean, you know, honestly, obviously skill is a big factor to any, you know, game you play at a competitive level, right? Mario Kart being no exception. But the fact that items can, like, at any given point really kind of swing the game back into your favor, right? It can really determine, you know, you can be leading for two laps right there in that first place or first place. And then somebody just out of nowhere, man, that shiny blue shell, uh, spiky blue shell can really disrupt a lot that's going on. I was talking to my man Bear about that. He says he can't count the number of times he's been in first place. It's all <laughs> looking good and then just boom, in an instant it's done. Hey, you gotta be in first place to get hit by the spiny yeah, That's what matters look, here. Look, it, it's, it's the way, it, it's basically rewarding you for being so good at the game. It's mm -hmm. a nice little present, nice little spiny shell present for you to get hit by. So going along with that, we're gonna be keeping our eye on three different levels of this race. Obviously you have your front runners and there's a strategy that goes with racing in first place because you have to be very defensive. Yeah, front Runners really just, they're probably phenomenal at doing time trials, so they really know their lines, they really know their course, they're going to hold defensive items as much as possible, get that distance, and then you're going to have these uh, mid-pack racers who like to play second, third, fourth, really play with second, third, fourth to hit out first, and then take it over on the final lap to make sure they get first place. It's a weird little kind of like, uh, kind of honor code you have with second place as third, fourth place, you don't hit them. You don't, so that way you can hit first place. Then you have the chaotic people that are going to be in the, be in the back of the pack who may, <laughs> who may be just... Is that chaotic neutral or chaotic good? <laughs> no, it's, it's chaotic. <laughs> it's, it's chaotic good. But they'll probably pull really powerful items because the most powerful items in the games do not spawn until 30 seconds into the game itself mm -hmm. for every course. But also 9th and 12th, they're going to have the most powerful items. And the way that they use them will make or break them. They're getting set for the very first race here, as we mentioned, eight races. As far eight eight races and on these courses here, of course, you've got twelve racers. And how about G and B seventy five from New York City? What do we know about him here, Bear? What has you excited about watching him race today? He is one of the most chaotic players I've played with, but also he was letting me know that he could probably alternate between different characters. So I'm curious to know what he decides to be on there and a solid racing overall for what I've seen from him. 
As we said, we're getting set for this very first course here, this first race. Yummy Bagel here, and we've talked about a lot of these different racers here. We have a Wario with Mr. Scooty. As we like to say the joke, there's no holes in his game here. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I was thinking, I was wondering if you're going to bring that oh, one up. No, yes, I had to go early with it. I mean, you know, again, you know, you look at all the racers that we have present. Yes, they're from all walks of life, all over the planet. It's so good to see. But the one thing we, they all have in common, obviously, just solidified in their gameplay, how they play in front of this live crowd is definitely the thing that's going to be the most standout for me. And then, Bear, how about Adam, one of the heavy favorites, potentially? Adam is a phenomenal racer. Very very fast, very well lines. His I've raced with Adam multiple different times, and every time I've raced with him, it's a pure, pure pleasure because it's a, it's a fight to the finish. And uh, we're going to see a wonderful race from him. Obviously, lots of competition around Adam. Brings us to our next racer, Strike from the Northwest, Boise, Idaho. And looking at Strike, also another favorite. And one of those Waluigi's with the bitty buggy here, E. Let me tell you something. I talked to Strike. I asked him, how are you feeling about this competition? What are you going to bring to the table? He says, I'm not leaving the stage without first place. That's all you need to know about him. After Strike. Yes, the horn does work on the hat, by the way. We tested it out earlier. We have Mankalore from Columbus, Ohio here, Bear. Yeah, Mankalore is very well known for uh, bringing very powerful items up front. So we're going to probably see a little bit of chaos from them. Great racing overall. After Mankalore, we move on to our next racer, Riding My Pidgey. Not quite yet a Pidgeotto, it's all right, but from, <laughs> from Las Vegas. Obviously, he's done very well, very competitive scene. We continue to move down the line. And how about Bowser from Quincy, Massachusetts? A little bit of a holler here. You got a double point right there, E. I told you, that is the wild card pick. He's been on this stage, he's won on this stage, and he's very confident in his Mario Karting abilities as well. I think that makes him an extremely dangerous pick. Then the very experienced LA Cruiser from SoCal top down from Compton, California. Bear, you have to love what he brings to the uh, table. He, he, LA Cruiser brings a wonderful energy, and he's going to be our token person using inside drifting uh, bike, which is oh, basically really? like Mario Kart Wii. Moving along here. It's Adrian from Tijuana, Mexico, wow. crossing the border over here to get ready to race, and obviously another very solid racer for Adrian. Looking forward to seeing what they can do. And then Cozy Fog right here. Home track advantage from Redmond, Washington. Cozy Fog, DK, and the Biddy Buggy. Solid racer as well. Still rounding out our 12 racers here as we continue to make our way and get set for the very first course here in just a second. And really with all of these here, Bear, they have so much experience racing against one another over the past couple of days here. They've had a chance to really build a really nice rapport. Yeah, there a lot of them have been racing together, warming up, really getting to know each other. Um, it's nice to see Enya as well, representing Montreal, Quebec. Very solid racer overall. We're going to see some really good driving from them. I've raced them before. Wonderful person. As we mentioned, a lot of talent on display. It won't be the same build for everybody, and that'll be exciting. It won't just be Waluigi on the Wiggler for the most part. And then we have G1989 from Vancouver, BC. Our only Roy racer, but also very talented on the Mr. Scooty. Oh, 100%. It's nice to see yet again, you know, again, that representation from just all over. Got a couple members from Canada, obviously some representation for Mexico as well. NA all around, just an incredible talent pool. You got the little introductions right there. Little introductions, but big time gameplay awaits. Mankalore, I see you squeezing the hat. I see it. <laughs> he couldn't wear it right now because of how he obviously has to wear the headset. But yes, that accompanies him every single place he goes. Our 12 racers are getting set to start their engines. Our very first course, though, will be Sydney Sprint. You love this one, Bear. I absolutely love this course. This is one of the most phenomenal, best courses they've added into the DLC. This is the rise. This debuted in 2021 in Mario Kart Tour. Uh, it's going to have... Two of the variations of the course combined in the lap, the final lap, you're actually going to be going uh, reverse of, 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 of the Sydney Sprint. And one fun fact on this specific course itself is that uh, in, in the Mario Kart Tour version, the trains, the toads, they throw actually mushrooms, bananas, and bombs. But in here, they change it just to coins, so it's not as chaotic. It's nice they toss those coins. That inflation's real here, EE. E. And as they get set <laughs> to, for Sydney Sprint, really, it, it's a mid-pack course here, EE, e., meaning... You're not going to necessarily hang out and bag in the rear end and collect powerful items because you've got to make sure you stay close to the leader. Well, I mean, it's quick, it's fast, and it's right to the point, right? This is kind of one of those reasons you like a course like this because you know you're going to get a lot of action right out of the gate. Obviously, queuing up right now. We have the countdown. We have our first race, and we are ready to go. And they are off. Here it is, the very first course in our Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Championship Cup 2022. You see G&B 75 
Bagel strike and Denton already strike falling to 12th here, Bear. You know what? You got to make a comeback, okay? This is a great comeback course. He can't give up. You, it only really matters about the final lap. Mankalore in third. A lot of traffic in this bunch right here. LA Cruiser, your bottom right. Red Shell ready to roll. But how about Bowser? Bottom left has that mushroom here. EE -E certainly can utilize that here soon. Absolutely going to be looking to strike. As Bear said, comebacks are absolutely very prevalent on a stage like this. No reason to get discouraged in those opening rounds for sure. You see, just taking control right now. First place, though, belonging to my man Adam, just holding it down. Adam, without an item at the current moment, is able to avoid the red shell. And then here is Mankalore in second. Mushroom with the boomerang on deck, making their way through the park. Excellent lines here, Bear, because you have to be careful. It looks like we had a little bit of a collision against the wall. Yeah, indeed. And also, Mankalore will likely... Uh uh, he actually used the mushroom, but most of the most person in first place, this is actually critical. Having first place with the mushroom gives you the opportunity to dodge the spiny shell. So if, whoever's in first will likely hold on to that as long as they can. And e e look at how frequently they're checking their mirrors. Obviously, you love that during your driver's license I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little disoriented just looking at that. <laughs> but for these guys, it's just another day at the office, and you have to do that. Just oh. understanding everybody's on your tail, and that lightning could be a big turnaround. You see, and... Trying to make a uh, play to kind of get a little bit out of there. Here comes Adrian. And Adrian dodged that dodged that lightning, was able to pull up the mushroom, put a cut here, and is probably going to go for that double item box for protection. Final lap. We see riding my Pidgey in eighth, Mankalore in third, LA Cruiser in eighth, trying to make their way 15 points for first place. It will be chaotic down the stretch here. Babam going off. And still hanging out in the back, but it is striking first. Red Shell coming. Oh. Green Shell defense oh. strike, almost there. Just has to make this oh, turn. This is tough. This With is GNB tough. GNB coming GB's. right behind. Is it going to be striker oh. GNB? Quick look at Yummy Bagel. Red Shell ready to go. Strike. Just a few more turns here, Bear. This is a solid one. He's solid one overall. Nice little finish there. Got really lucky, but GNB did not throw the Red Shell forward, given that he was defenseless. But overall, solid racing from the strike there. Nice finish. GNB was second. Bowser with a uh, with third place and in fourth. Again, if you didn't get top four, it's not over. You have seven more races. It's all about your point placement in the races itself. Strike an excellent job hanging out in first and EE. Of course, when you look back, when you are that front runner, you yep. have to make sure you have a defensive item to protect your rear side. I mean, just the fact that he put himself in such a sensational position, just getting that first place and able to just hold it down. You mentioned the item play, like the item control, being able to hold on to those when you're most going to need them. Yes, being able to deflect all of the, the opposition coming at you is very, very important. Strike doing a master class at that to take that first course. Also, Bear, I love the strategy in second place. You have to make sure that you aren't being too aggressive. You got to protect your second place because those are 12 crucial points in this whole scheme. Yeah, uh, ultimately, like that's probably the reason why the second place threw the red shell, even though optimally they probably should have thrown it forward it, it, because it would have hit first place on glider. But sometimes you just got to keep your points with them when it comes to the Grand Prix overall because you're, you're, it's the difference. The di Three points can make or break the uh, the whole standings for itself in the Grand Prix. Let's go ahead and check out the standings after our first race. Strike with 15 points, G and B 75 with 12, and there's your boy E.E. E. Bowser getting 10 points in third place. But as we mentioned, anything can happen, and as we get set for our very next course here, SNES Mario Circuit 3. I mean, this is where I got my Mario Kart license 30-plus <laughs> years ago here, Bear. Getting a chance to now do this in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, what's the strategy for oh, so many of these racers? Th so this specific course is the ideal bagging course, which is basically, we're going to see half of, half of the racers are going to hold back, try to get the most powerful items they can, because you have a great comeback factor here. And if you were in the back, the, the thing is in each Grand Prix, if you finish last, so the bottom six, it's actually an advantage for them, so they can kind of hang back farm their items, try to make make or break the last lap and a half. And the biggest thing for them is they're going to go for boxes and coins so they can go faster. And this is a really good point you bring up because EE -E, coin management plays a huge yes. role. As you know, you get 10 coins, you're going to be moving as fast as you possibly can, but you want to make sure you're still collecting coins to prevent the opposition from getting any faster. Oh, 100%. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you understand, yes, you want to keep yours in full, right? Just be to get that extra ad additional speed for sure. But being able to cut off another additional resource for an opponent is huge, especially, you know, when you see this field, how evenly matched a lot of these guys are. Sure, you'll have some guys that create some separation just naturally, maybe a little bit more skilled. But honestly, we, we said it all the time, items play such a huge part. You've got to know every little aspect. And Bear, what I love is mushrooms are so powerful. 
on this course. There are so many different areas where you can save some time by just cutting some corners. Oh, absolutely. It's going to be it's going to be wild. If you have a golden mushroom in this course, it is it you are sorry to be ironic. You're golden. <laughs> 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 Nothing wrong with being ironic here. All right, here we go. SNES Mario Circuit 3 Strike was our winner last race. Let's see if you can repeat. Obviously, this will be a fast and frantic race, and already so you already see a little bit of a strategy to go backwards here, Bear. We already see about four people that are going backwards. <laughs> They're holding back. Actually, six right now. Wow. It's going to be insane. <laughs> yeah, just you want to you want to keep an eye on who will grab lightning and who's going to grab an item to dodge that lightning. This is clearly not a Black Friday sale. Nobody in a hurry to get out there, and already we're taking a look at Strike in 11th and Yummy Bagel in 12th hanging out there with those three mushrooms, but of course, there's a lot of ground you can cover with those mushrooms. G and B 75, but now we cut into Adrian with the star and a couple of mushrooms here. EE -E, gonna eat up some ground. You know, honestly, for like the casual observer, you're probably so confused at just what just took place. But really, it just—I <laughs> mean, seriously—it just makes so much more sense though when you realize the kind of items they're trying to gain access to and how this track itself does tend to play out. So really, making some bold decisions. But we're seeing N right now in an elite position, got that first place on lock. How safe is this lead here, Bear, for not, N? Not safe. Not safe. You're in first place the last last lap of this course. Mm -hmm. You really have to make distance. <laughs> so it is, it is, it is. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, whoever used lightning, yep. four people dodged that lightning. So it is going to be an intense final lap here. It's going to be pure chaos, given the, whatever it is has here. If you look at the mini map, N still in first. However, N finally growing up like a big boy and getting some more speed. Red Shell coming. And trying to fight off some competition. Coin in hand, looking for a defensive item. Going to gobble up that double box. Not in time, Ooh. though, EE. -E. Mushroom oh. usage, perfect by that by, by GNB here. Going through, it looks like a nice little star. This could make or break. This could oh. be it. Mighty oh. Shell coming. Is it going to oh, get no, it? No, no, no. Oh, my god. Oh. 1989 has to eat that in GNB 75. Stealing the victory here, E. And I don't think Waluigi's tone, it couldn't be any more perfect to describe what just took place. He absolutely snatched that one away. And Bear, you said it perfectly, down the stretch, right? No lead is ever safe until you cross that finish line. And you know what? It pains me to see Roy getting hit. That is, that is my boy. And it is difficult when you get hit right at the line, especially after the dash panel, because you really have nothing else to, to, to regain your speed there. That was really rough. But... Fantastic racing by GNB and Strike maintaining that point lead there. Yep. That, was, that was pretty critical because given that it's such a chaotic race, SNES Mario Circuit 3, honestly, if you place top four in that, you're winning. What I love is the collective groan from the crowd because we've all been there before. Oh, yes, you're right on. there at the finish line and then a spiny shell comes in just to ruin your Monday. I've Let's go ahead and check out the that, <laughs> Let's go ahead and check out the standings here. GNB 75 moves to the top, tied up with Strike here, 27 points. Sizable lead here, Bear. Twenty-seven to sixteen. Indeed, just two races in. Yeah, that is that is a uh, math. That's a that's an eleven point difference. <laughs> so, <laughs> so math. So so, but it but it's still anybody's game. Anybody can still win this GP. Even LA Cruiser with six points. If LA Cruiser make, makes the top three finishes and the rest of the courses, he can still make it down there. Getting set for our next course here, we have Coconut Mall. Ooh. Obviously, if you have played Mario Kart Wii and have used that Wii mote and popped that wheelie on the motorcycle, you're very familiar with this course here. And Bear, real quickly, Coconut Mall, you love the shortcut that's early in this course. Love the, sh the shortcut early is pretty critical, but in reality, the best thing about Coconut Mall is if you have a bullet bill and you use it right at the Coco shops, you're going to be going through the whole mall and you're on speed running like you're on fastest small walker out there <laughs> you, it is a fantastic course also the one fun fact on here is that they updated the coconut mall so the cars move now and they spin at you and they do build donuts okay tricks so, in the parking lot reminds me of ee -E behind the wheel well let's not talk about that girls. <laughs> <laughs> all right gnb 75 and striker your leaders tied at 27 points apiece they will take the pole positions here and this time more of a true start out the gate you see those ramps obviously green means you can go a little bit faster and there's the shortcut to the right if you want to cut through the mall. Obviously, a mushroom helps out with that. Strike right now, EE -E hanging on to that first place lead. Yeah, I mean, Strike, you know, he's obviously, uh, again, as I said, a lot of people, a lot of eyes on him for sure, and he's definitely demonstrated why he is such a phenomenal racer in these first two 
uh, courses that we have seen selected. But man, I tell you, it's only going to get harder and harder. Even Barry, you pointed out, like somebody like LA Cruz, a little bit of a rough start, but still has an opportunity to bring it back with the right amount of places. Absolutely. And one of the most key things in any mall, don't go broke. So you want to make sure you collect coins because you want to go as fast as you can possibly here. And pulling the mushroom in first place of Adrian, pretty critical because you have a nice way to make a comeback here. But it's difficult given you have Pidgey with triple bananas, putting that pressure into the beautiful, beautiful drag with that triple. Yeah, Adrian eating some potassium there and slipping up. LA Cruiser moving to first. Yes. Go ahead and do that for Gen X. I hear you, Mangalore. <laughs> Ooh, is Swapping double, spots though the, here, Bear. The double mushroom and one of them having a triple single mushroom out is this is super smart to hold on to that. Because you have two two ways to dodge the spiny shell, but more importantly, you have ways to kind of make a comeback Ooh. if you get hit. Riding my Pidgey, fireballs in hand, unleashing some fury. Has here, the mushroom, can here use comes a shortcut shell. here soon. Here comes Let's see if Mangalore was able to dodge this correctly. Not No pressure on them at all. Let's see. Let's find out. Ooh, oh, beautiful. Mangalore, boys, the spiny shell and Wonderful. stays in first place, EE. -E. Cool as a cucumber, like not even a chance that was going to touch him. Having this lead right now, not trying to relinquish it at all. He is playing out of his mind, but GMB hot on this trail with him. GNB launching the red shell. Has a banana peel behind. Oh, Mangalore. He only has, he only has no one point. defensive item. This is though. tough. This is Trying tough. Trying to close it out. Mangalore. One more turn. Oh. Lightning ball is... coming. Can go, Mangalore go, go, go. makes it through? Tiny size and all. Mangalore he, getting the checkered flag. He makes it through, and the two Wario's were able to dodge the lightning. Yummy Bagel and Adrian wow. to make it to those third and fourth spots, which is wow. pretty critical for them. How about Strike falling all the way to 10th in that race? And that is now bunched up the top Ooh. of the standings here. So as you mentioned, anything can happen in these given races here I, in EE. I almost feel like a commentator cursed it to an extent, right? I was like, the <laughs> door is still you. wide open. We are still very early into these courses. And just like that, you see somebody who was, you know, at the, the top of that leaderboard just have a very bad race. And, you know, that can really play a hand and how this is all going to fold out. That young man right there, Mankalore, Mac he put on a heck of a performance in that and, and the key thing is, is all the other racers understand who's the point leader. And if you're a smart racer, you understand I am not going to hit last place. I'm going to hit with the point leader. So, yep. so if, I was, if, we were, if I was competing, I, I would definitely hit whoever's in first place because that's the only way you can do it. You have to hit them out. It's part of the game. It's part of the Grand Prix. You know, you got to be a winner. And you would never turn around at the finish line and throw up a bomb, right? Right before you uh, cross the finish line. No, not, no, no, no. I would not, I would not do Let's that. Let's go ahead and check out the point leaders here after we got done with three races. And as we said, it is starting to heat up because it is getting bunched up. GNB 75, a nine-point lead, but Strike all of a sudden has Mankalore in the rear view mirror. And there's a whole lot more that can happen still here at EE with five more races, and it just goes to show you, you cannot take a race off. Oh, 100%, not not at all. I mean, I love the fact that you're already seeing like such big shifts, I feel like, at the start of things. I mean, we've got three down, we've got five more to go. Some of those guys who are kind of hovering in the middle of the pack, absolutely understanding, they still have an opportunity to rise up a little bit. I mean, Barry articulated, articulated it well. When you have those guys who are in those top like three positions, they're, they're going to draw a little bit more attention, and that makes it a little bit more dangerous and difficult to win in a course it, selection like this. It also makes it super dangerous because the top three are all Waluigi's. Mm. So you're going to have someone, if they have lightning, they're likely going to go for the Waluigi's on the minimap to make their day miserable. So you have to be careful because sometimes you just might be caught in the crossfire. So we saw a rather simple course a couple races ago, SNES Mario Circuit 3. Now we're getting ready for a course that has a lot going on. Ninja oh. Hideaway here, Bear. This is this is by far my... It was big blue used to be my favorite course in this game. Ninja Hideaway overseeded that. Ninja Hideaway <laughs> is a phenomenal course. Very technical. You need to learn it to understand it and enjoy it. It debuted in 2021 in Mario Kart Tour. It is identical to the Mario Kart Tour, but has great graphics. There is a critical shortcut in the Piranha Plant boards on the bottom path. You can do it with a mushroom, a shell, or you can actually do it without a mushroom. You just need to do it pretty strategically. You might be able to see some people do that. Also, big thing on here in the glider part, be careful. Thunderstorms are coming. You're going to get a lightning bolt pretty pretty likely if you're in the glider section. Yeah, it's a huge glider section, so we will see if GNB75 can hang on for the lead. There they are in the top left and third right now, but keep an eye on who gets a shell or a mushroom. We mentioned a very sizable Ooh. shortcut. If you stay to the bottom, a lot of the racers here decide to go to the top here, Bear. Top path is the best path. You get coins in your double item box the first lap. The first lap specifically, best path to take. 
riding my Pidgey, taking the shortcut already in the glider section here. Mushroom and a red shell. You love to have that item combination, EE. Oh, absolutely. I mean, at any given point, you know, take out somebody in front of you and then make up some ground as well or just put some distance between you should you need to escape a tricky situation. We see N there taking a big hit, and that's going to allow Cozy Ooh. Fog to slip into first place to enjoy this lead momentarily. But you see Adrian hot on his tail as, again, you just see the ever-changing ebb and flow of how the gameplay can go. Nice draft. Nice draft on Adrian here. Yes, yeah, very nice there. draft right there as the two of them are switching spots here at first, and it's really a two heavyweight race at this point but a lot can happen and as you get to laps two and three here bear what do you have to really keep in mind if you're a front runner right now the the spiny shell coming through to hitting pidgey oh, sadly here <laughs> it comes spiny shell locked in and, and knocking pidgey oh, out of the that's, air. that's, that's oh, the worst just short you hate to see it you hate to see that that's right that's there. hard <laughs> Mankalore in second, Cozy Fog in first. Cozy Fog doesn't have a defensive item here, though. Has to be very careful, EE. -E. Yeah, Cozy Fog understanding, but look at that. Ten full coins. Oh, Adrian making a very rare miscue on that. Going to lose some ground. As we see, Mankalore hot on Cozy Fog's tail, and this is really big for him. If he can amass two first place finishes in a row, that's going to be huge for him in the standings. Yummy Bagel trying to take a bite out of first place. Cozy Fog making their way through. Switching to the Mushroom. Nice. Mm. Able to get through to the shortcut, and now it's Mankalore. Chaining, chaining boxes into a double red shells is pretty pretty great for the last run here. Depends what Cozy has, but we never know. Oh, he's he has nothing. Oh, man. Oh, this is rough. Yeah. He'll, he will likely get hit. Mankalore. An ape with just a tie doesn't have a single item, and it's going to be Mankalore. Oh, Mankalore no. gets knocked. And strike, strike, strike in first place. With the beautiful red red at the end there. Oh, my goodness. What a wonderful finish from Strike. So, so smart understanding that Mankalore was going to throw that red. Redded, redded Mankalore right after. Defenseless. Solid W from Strike. With Yummy Bagel making his second as well, and Jet with third. Strike being so cerebral right there. I mean, how often did we even speak his name? on that race, not one time until those closing seconds where he just creeped up and just boom, took control, took the lead, and reasserts himself at the top of that leaderboard. And we talked about Luck Bear. If you get stuck in a situation where you do not have a defensive item and you've got some heat coming behind you, there's not a whole lot you can do. Honestly, the best thing to do is slow down. If you, if you see, if you, if one of, some of the players are not using their back cameras as much as they should be. You need to see what's behind you. Mm -hmm. If someone has a red shell and you're in first and you got nothing, slow down. There's no reason for you to get hit later on unless you're going to get the double item box, unless you can be able to, to execute a wall dodge, which is pretty difficult to do if you're, but some of these players can do it. Yeah, we saw Mankalore hustling for that double item box, could not get it in time, and then got passed by a handful of racers. Let's go ahead and check out the standings here after we are now four races deep in this championship cup here and strike right up top and how about that just a one point lead ee -E over gnb 75. he said i'm back y'all forgot about <laughs> me now don't let one one bad race uh make you forget exactly who i am yes strike taking the number one rank as it stands right now we're halfway through these courses but it is really kind of heating up. You see G and B, only one point separating them. And then Mankalore, we've already seen him make, make a rise before. No reason to think a couple of solid top two, three placings can't help elevate him some more. This first place, while in the hands of Strike, it is far from safe. Halfway through this Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Championship Cup 2022, now we're getting set for Shroom Ridge Bear. And this is a track that you really love a lot of turns obviously you've got some labor day traffic here it's going to crowd things up what do you keep in mind here uh the biggest thing is that in ds shroomage you do not have double item boxes so you need to get every item box mm. that you can possibly get it is super vital uh there are two critical shortcuts one with a glider section they added and one at the very end with the pipe wind you need to have mushrooms for both but we're probably going to see people front running this course this is a beautiful front running course Strike a one point lead over GNB 75, and already it's Bagel out in first, but battling position with Strike. Strike able to pick up somebody EE -E with that red shell. Yeah, not a surprise. I mean, you kind of have a little bit of a cluster, right? Just put some separation between you guys, and then just off to the race as we go. It's the end right there uh, with the first place currently right now, trying to absolutely reestablish himself. How about that? So, a uh, critical thing here, N actually made the smart decision mm -hmm. of using the inside drifting uh, Yoshi bike because this course is phenomenal if you're, if we're inside drifting. So they actually changed it into a submission of this course for the advantage. And you can obviously take a much better line in that situation. And you mentioned no double item and boxes, he, so you're going to have to be oh, very careful and here. And here comes the spiny shell. Let's see what happens with first place. I'm pretty sure they're probably going to try to hit the car. 
Well, they uh, they probably did, or they had a Superborn. I and would, I was able to avoid it. However, you see the blooper come on screen. It's going to block some of the vision, but EE, -E, you figure they know these courses like the back of their hand, and it's Bagel in second. Oh, Ooh, Bagel wow. eating the green shell on their nine. Jordan's first commentator curse of the evening. You love to see it right there. <laughs> They're focused on strike in that second place. He is chasing down, but you see the, some good separation between it's the two. Pidgey making a play right now. I'm going to go back and forth with strike battling for that second and third spot. Given how wide the pack is and the Wario in the back and the blooper coming out, yep. it's very likely we're going to have showers coming up here with the lightning strike. And in first, you heard the forecast coming in. Yes, there is the lightning bolt. G and B75, however, in that bullet bill, making huge ground here, Bear. Yeah, and it, it is critical. You need to understand that once the blooper comes out, you have a high chance of a lightning. Yep. And you need to be prepared for it. And GNB did a great job understanding it, but a spiny shell is on its way. The only thing they can do here is hit hit one of the cars, but they don't. They often nope. get to use the coin. Oh, it is a rough spot. It and strike, Ooh. trying to build upon their lead. Leaves the bomb behind, and Strike's gonna pick up 15 <laughs> more points. Strike did a critical thing. Use the mushroom at the at the at the pipe cut. Bomb back, which is smart, given that they had to protect just in case anything happened. GMB fell into third from that spiny shell. Mm. Strike with that first. It is shaking up the standings here. This is a yeah. fantastic top four, top five. Honestly, after the fifth race, what a phenomenal racing. And really, EE, the decision making, the final 10 to 15 seconds of every single race has really determined the outcome here. And it really feels like Strike is doing just enough to hang near the front and then capitalizing on any mistakes. I mean, it's the collective the collective gas from the crowd that you're hearing that really lets you know just how close these races really are. You have somebody who seemingly, you know, has it well in hand, but as you said, you know, those last couple of seconds really just determines how it goes down, and Strike has found himself to be in a, a position to just succeed time and time again. Great item management, knows the courses, great track selection. I mean, you know, what can you say about this guy? Like, obviously, like we said, there's still plenty of room to work with, but he has got to be the one everyone's got their eye on. And even with that said, they can still not stop him. <laughs> now, Bear, what's interesting is we had a conversation about these loadouts and the cart selection, the wheels. Tell us the thought process with these top-level players. I know there's a lot of folks watching us that are trying to dip their toe into the competitive Mario Kart 8 Deluxe scene and want to know where do I even begin as far as my ride. So the most important thing is uh, your tires. Both, you want to have something with high acceleration, high mini turbo. You will see, notice a lot of them are using rollers, which is azure rollers. The red rollers are blue rollers. So super important there. And then beyond that, you want to make sure you pick a cart that handles well for what you would like. Your character is important, but in reality, you'll see a lot of these people using uh, heavy cruiser weights, which is like the Roy, Waluigi, Don Kong. They're all the same weight class. That's why we were mostly seeing that. But in general, heavier characters do a great job. But you can still win if a light character. My, one of my favorite characters is Shy Guy, and I really enjoy playing as Shy Guy. You can still do well, and there are some people that who do really well with Shy Guy. Hey, heavy characters can do well. There's hope for us, EE. All I right, listen. let's go ahead and check out the standings <laughs> here. Strike with a six point lead over G and B75, building on that advantage. Yummy Bagel, 13 points behind in third place. So it looks like it's starting to shape up into a two racer competition. Up next. Paris Promenade Bear. Ooh. Let's go ahead and have a croissant and take a tour through the city Beautiful. streets. But what stands out to you about this course? Beautiful course. I love one of my favorite courses they added into the game. This is debuted in 2019 in Mario Kart Tour. This it combines three variations and one for this itself. Um, at one point, it goes backwards. So on the final lap, if you're slow and if you're slow enough and you're fast enough, you'll meet someone. Maybe even you a bullet bill into your face, which happened to me many times. But so it's gonna be really interesting. There is a critical shortcuts with the piranha plant boards at the beginning um, and at the at the end. But in reality, we're gonna see a lot of uh, usually front running here. But we'll we'll probably see someone use the lightning at the end of the glider because it is a critical time to use it. Keep an eye out for the use of the bullet bill. Now, obviously, you figure EE, -E, all of these racers are aware of the lead that Strike is yes. building. You figure there's a huge bullseye on their back. A hundred percent. And Strike knows that even in first place, just immediately soaring out. But for everybody else, you have to understand, this is crunch time. You only have so many more races to have a chance to kind of knock Strike a little bit off of his pedestal and accumulate some points yourself. So really no room for error right now. I'm looking to see some of these guys who are kind of at the lower end of the standings really have a good showing in this race. It's imperative that they get some points on the board. And Strike is just running away, using their coin, 
gonna start probably holding onto that green shell for protection. Really smart for them to just be able to understand that they need to get this lead as far as possible as they can right now. And we saw a strike just run into the wall there, lost a little bit of ground. Here's a look at Adam in third place, sending the red shell forward. G and B75 in fifth. Trying to force the issue a little bit. Ooh. Oh, gets smacked by the fireball, and that'll bring them back to the pack, EE. Yeah, those straight, you know, those straight item hits, man. Sometimes they can really throw a wrench in your plan. Even somebody who's kind of higher up on the leaderboard. Yes, you kind of have a slower start, and that is the, you know, position you can really find yourself in. And right now, in that second position, really trying to hunt down strike. Gonna Here get comes a blooper. a blooper, and everybody is going for the double item boxes. And yep. there is so many people back there with superstars. And a spiny shell on the way is very likely. This is gonna just go really rough for Strike. Hopefully they gotta make a comeback after uh -oh, here. Uh -oh. Final lap, Strike gets smacked by the spiny shell and gets passed. Strike trying to hang on to one of those top three positions. And in first, green shell is gonna go ahead and negate the red shell. Riding my Pidgey, threatening in third. Strike all the way back down to seventh with just a coin, EE. -E. Just a coin and a dream at this point because it's not <laughs> looking too likely he's going to be able to take first in this one. So that is certainly going to open the door for somebody else to accumulate some much needed points. How about Ang? Get the double item box. Firmly in first place. Let's see if he can maintain it there. Uh, and a mushroom, in, a mushroom in second but it's very likely Adrian will go for the shortcut. But I don't think he'll make a break. Not enough distance here to make it through. He's gonna, probably going to get first. It was like Ang getting first place. Yep. Add, nice Adrian was second. And I believe Adam got third place there. Strike was also making their way forward, used a star right at the end, so we'll see how it finally shakes out. But looking at the results, Strike getting fifth place, and so that allows G and B to move a little bit closer, but still a seven point lead for Strike. And with only two races left, it's starting to look pretty impressive. If you are Strike, you've got to make sure you now protect that lead because everyone's going to try and bring you down. and. Really, EE, e, it's just that spiny shell that comes at the wrong time can totally negate a perfect race through the first two yeah, laps. Yeah, and it's tough, too, because you're, you know, if you don't have the right item to combat it or you're not in the right situation on the, the course as well, it's really just kind of just have to take the hit, lose the momentum, and just hope you've already amassed enough of a lead where it won't put you too far behind. In the case of Strike, you know, fifth place finish, certainly not something I'm sure he's accustomed to based off the standards he's set, but still able to maintain the lead overall. So that's a good thing for him. Bear, in your experience, a seven-point lead with two races left. How safe is that? Not safe. You're not mm. safe. You need, no hesitation. You, you're, you need to be top two, top three finishing these next three races. And our next course is very chaotic. So it's going to make a break for a lot of these racers. There could be a good comeback. I think any. I think the top four can still win this whole mm. GP. Let's take wow. a look at the standings here in just a second as we get set for the final two races. Here they are. Strike, seven-point lead over GNB75. Yummy Bagel sitting there in third place, 18 points behind the leader. But then Adam and Mankalore, that is bunched up, four, five, six. Don't even dismiss Adrian at seventh place with 41 points. So, Mushroom Gorge. This is going to be very chaotic, as you said. Uh, How at, come? Uh, well, okay. The Wee, Wee Mushroom Gorge debuted in 2008 in the wonderful Mario Kart Wii, one of my favorite ones. There is a huge shortcut at the end called the Gap Shortcut. You can do. Mm -hmm. You must have a, a mushroom. Uh, it is it is technical, but you can anybody can really do it with some practice. But the biggest thing here is that the mushrooms themselves are the mushroom area. If the lightning does occur when you're in the mushroom area, you are out of luck. You are going to be falling, you're going to be smalling, you're going to be very, very frustrated. And every mushroom, every um, every mushroom has a different specific kind of property. So the, the red ones, you trick on it, you bounce in the sky. The green ones, you trick on it, you don't bounce in the sky. But the blue one is only one, it's a glider. So We're going to take a little detour and go to New York Minute, actually, oh. for the next course here. We've talked a little bit about these final two courses, okay. and it looks like we're going to make a Ooh. little change to New York Minute. And so right back at you, Bear, New York Minute, one of those Mario Kart Tour tracks. And we've talked before, there's a lot that can happen here, especially when you get to that final lap. Okay, yeah. So for New York Minute, it is combines the basically the, the four variants into in, 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 in one, two, and three. So you'll have, you're going to go through all of New York City, uh, you know, see all the, uh, the famous landmarks. And then in general, you're going it, to, it, one thing with New York Minute, it's, it's going to be super slick and watery. Similar to Neo Bowser City if you race in this game. So it has this kind of slickness to it. So your drifting is going to be a little bit different. Um, at one point in the course, it does go into technically reverse. But it's very rare you're going to inquire anybody that's going to kind of facing you in that, that section. And this is another mid-pack course here, EE, e., where you can go ahead and 
Hang out at the front or hang out in the middle. It's not one that's going to benefit you if you're just trying to collect the bullet bills and the lightning bolts at the end. Yeah, 100%. I mean, and, and I think for a lot, you know, just based on what Bear said, too, like how this lead is just not safe, that's kind of a benefit, too, you know, to our top four, top five right there. Still itching to maybe not strike off of his position and, you know, usurp him, take that first place. Because with just two races to go, yes, you know, you get those kind of more chaotic courses. I think that's really going to benefit you when you're trying to make a play like that. One thing I want to say, Bear, a shout out to the wonderful crowd we have here as well, too. Indeed. We have got just an excellent group of fans here. It's great to be back Ooh. in person as well, too. You feel the energy here. And with that, take me through the mind Goodness. of our racers here because this is different than playing online or playing in a land. You've got a crowd, maybe a little bit more pressure. It's just a lot of pressure. I, 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 don't, I don't envy them for being up there. <laughs> it, it, it's pressure because you have the crowd behind you. You, you really want to race your best, but also you want to make sure that you can perform well here. Well, for you, I mean, I know you, you know, you do competitive racing yourself. Do you find much of a difference in just how you approach everything online versus offline? Because, like, obviously, I'm sure you've competed offline, but, like, for a crowd like this, that's pretty insane. Offline and online, completely different. Online is just you, your monitor, and your own, your own battle. But when you're, when, you're in, when you're in front of people, when you're next to your competitor, it's a different feeling. Because, one, if you hit me, I can look at you later and be like man that was that was i was unfortunate you know i really i really didn't like that did i did i offend you yeah but but more in reality you actually find that camaraderie that's the one thing nice thing about in-person mario kart tournaments is you really find out that there's other people in their real life they're not just their me's they're mm -hmm. they actually right. they, a lot of them look like their me's actually a lot of these people eight nine of them i knew them from the from for the past couple years they all look like their me's which is hilarious but i was able to to really kind of connect with them, get that experience, and as a player in this in this situation, being in front of the crowd, you know you want to one play for yourself. You know it is tough if you're in the bottom rankings right now, but you can still make a difference. You can still fight for those top sauce, maybe get podium. That's the kind of goal when you when you're at the last leg of the few races. You want to do your best, have a good performance, do what you can, and then if you're in the top three uh, GP in the end of this and any of these kind of Grand Prix. You are fighting for your life. You need to make sure that you don't get hit. You're going to play super defensive. We're going to see Strike play the most defensive as mm. possible, <laughs> knowing that they are have a target on their back. And EE, you have casted so many events where yeah. someone is on the verge of claiming a championship, and it's a different mentality to close things out. Everybody can start hot, but to really seal the deal and have that clutch moment, that clutch play down the stretch, it takes a different breed. It really does. I mean, you know, it really, and it separates the good players from the great players, right? And we obviously understand every single person that we've seen on the stage has had those moments of greatness, right? But to win a championship, to capture a title on a stage like this, in front of a crowd. This is why I, I did allude to the fact that I really did think uh, Bowser would have a, a nice opportunity because he's won on in situations like this, whereas like another... A lot of the opposition has not competed here. But, you know, one thing I will say about Strike and several others, ice cold blood in those veins because they are showing up and they are showing out. And Bear, keep it real with me. Everybody understands the standings right now. They see Strike at the top. How out of their way will people go to bring Strike down just to keep it competitive the final race? I think if you're in the top five, you're probably going to aim for Strike. Mm. You're probably going to be relentless. But in reality... Some of these players, they might have checked out and might just have a good time. I see a Streetle in, in, the, in, the, in the midst, but I think that's because this course specifically performs really nicely with the Streetle uh, vehicle itself. Off we go. New York Minute Pin Ultimate Race here in this Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Championship Cup 2022. It's Strike and everybody else at this point. Early look here. You've got Bowser on the bottom left. All of a sudden, N in second place. And you've got Cozy Fog in fifth. Still kind of bunched at the beginning here, EE. E. Oh, 100%. And is definitely one of those people I'm looking forward to maybe have an opportunity to still claim that first place. We'll have to keep a watchful eye on him. But Strike right now holding down second. Adam Ooh, in first place. Oh, that, they is, are, that is risky. Yes. You need to be careful with that. Considering where to detonate that, just selects to just chuck it behind him. Oh, misses out on the double item box, though. And that is N that is going to have to hit the brakes here momentarily. Another red shell coming. L.A. Cruiser, great to call his name, in third place yes, right sir. now. Trying to hunt down the leaders. And Mankalore in fourth using that mushroom Ooh. to cruise around right on the heels of L.A. Cruiser. Grabbing up a couple of coins, but it's strike once again, Bear in the lead. And he's neck and neck, has, holding a mushroom in first, understanding even if they get redded, even if a spiny shell comes, they have a way to make a good comeback here. Yeah. 
Final lap, Strike really trying to take control of this championship. We'll see what will unfold here. Strike in first. That boo will go ahead and leave him with a green shell. Blooper coming on, which I imagine, Bear, expect a lightning bolt. Uh, it, it, very likely at the end of this here, but it's very rough because you have such a tight finish. This is just a straightaway here. Strike can just run away with this as long as they don't get hit, yep. which they have. Wonderful to see that first place there. I believe LA Cruiser got second. And yeah. Strike picking up another win. It might be enough to clinch it. LA Cruiser riding out of the rising out of the ashes here like a phoenix and getting 12 points. Yeah, how, and about, so how about Pitchy we'll sliding in there at third, too? Yeah, Pitchy yeah. doing very nice. well, getting third here. So we'll see what the final leaderboard looks like. But it, it just really seems like it's striking everybody else right now, Bear. At this point, it was between Strike, the GNB, and a few other folks. But Strike is that, that first place finish, and I saw where GNP finished. Yep. Really shook things up. All they have to do is pray that they have a lucky Mushroom Gorge run, and it can it can go hard, it can go rough. As we get set for Mushroom Gorge, our final course here in just a moment, it has been Strike that is claiming the majority of the checkered flags. We have one more race left here in this Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Championship Cup, and EE, -E, you really love the fact that Strike rose to the occasion. As you see the standing, Strike building a very sizable lead heading into our final race. In fact, that should clinch it right there. 18 points ahead of GNB 75. That'll probably do it. So to this point, we get set for this exhibition race and just a chance to uh, wave to the crowd. Well, the thing is, I mean, Strike, you could tell he's obviously driven in New York traffic before. Everybody else, <laughs> not so much. You know, you saw they were having a little bit of trouble. If you've ever been to New York, you know what I'm talking about. But Strike, a veteran in his field and obviously separating himself from the rest of the pack. You said that lead, double digits, one race to go. It's going to be incredibly unlikely that he lets go of this one. But I'll tell you what, nothing wrong with fighting for second, too, because we have a lot of good competitors still here who can make some waves. Well, of course, bragging rights, Bear. I mean, you can say that you came here, competed against 12 of the top racers, and you held your own and finished possibly top three. Yep. It, it is a fight for podium at this point. Mathematically, Strike is in a good spot. The, the, it, the point system-wise, great spot there, but I really want to see who finishes second and third. Given this race, Mushroom Gorge, one of my favorite week courses, very phenomenal. We're probably going to see some pure chaos here given that a lot of people will probably get a really rough time in the mushroom area. Keep an eye out for the final turn. There's a huge gap skip. You will need a mushroom and a lot of technique, but that is something that these racers can certainly pull off. Final race here as we get set. Strike your leader, but there is still second and third place to race for here. Yummy Bagel, the top of your screen, and six with those three bananas. L.A. Cruiser, after an impressive third place, hanging out in second, E.E. Oh, absolutely, and I'm glad to see L.A. Cruiser, even though it's a little bit late, making a little bit of a resurgence Ooh. to make sure people are aware. Yes, I am in this as well, but N right now, take a look at him. He's got that first place on lock. Obviously, we know it's very early, so it's far from safe, but Strike being so far behind, a little bit telling that everybody could have some eyes on him and just like, you're not winning this. And is in first, has the coin, looking for a defensive item. No real immediate threat behind them. Adam with the star and a couple of mushrooms making their way forward. Excellent use of the draft there. And, and Bear, we keep an eye out of Bowser uh, as well too, Bear. I will keep an eye out anyway back here. Oh, that Ooh. is their early lightning. I, uh, interesting that that spot there, because given that where the pack was, Whoever used that really wanted to hit someone specific, not really the full frontal of the pack itself. Here's Strike with the Piranha pant Plant giving a little bit of a boost. Here comes a spiny shell, though. Uh -oh. Adam going to take over first He's place here soon and going to eat. Oh, avoids the spiny shell right there. Ooh, but Adam Adam actually was able to ex execute the gap cut really nicely and, got, and is now in first place here dragging a red shell. Pretty nice defense here, but it all really depends on this point here. With Strike hanging in it in second, not not giving up knowing that they're in a really good spot. Yeah, they still want to fight here. Strike wants to put this thing away here, EE. -E. Leave no doubt Ooh, whatsoever a, who's a the top racer. And the last, this, this is going to be rough. Anything could happen. A lightning, another spiny shell. It can be a really rough time here. Ooh, and Adrian with the... Oh, here we go. Oh, There's the lightning. Adam, lightning. Adam able to clear the gap, though. That's huge for Adam. Adam trying to close it out. Let's can see. Adam make it home? I believe... Adam in the wiggler. No, Adam gets past. No. And how about that? At the tail end, <laughs> a trio of Waluigi's leading the way. Strike finishes in the top three, but what a remarkable finish. And that is N 
just blowing by at the last minute getting the checkered flag. I love e -E. to see that because N was in the lead at the start of that race and was able to just at those last seconds again continuing to prove the you know the old story true. Hey, that first place lead, it's never safe. Those final seconds always so telling and N able to sneak his way in there. But how about Strike? He did a good job playing from behind too. Balance back to another top three finish and Bear, of course, assuring that he is going to be your victor here today. So it's a foregone conclusion that Strike was going to run away with this. So congratulations to Strike, our champion here for the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Championship Cup 2022. Huge round of applause for him. But let's go ahead and up. check out the final standings here in just a moment because as we said there's a lot to race for here bear it's not just about first place it's coming here saying you race against 12 of the top racers and you finished in second or third potentially yeah and that's a, that's a big proud moment because podium when it comes to racing top three is what really matters because the, the game itself rewards you for top three so being able to say that you get placed second or third and the championship cup was going to be a wonderful experience big rag right but and also in reality one did want to mention Great racing for everybody on here. Even if you pull out below top three, you were one of the one of the few of the, out of the thousands that made it here. You put, you put on a good show. You did your best, and you, and it was really fun watching everybody. And obviously, e -E doing it in front of the live crowd with these stakes, it, it takes another little step to do that, and that's going to be some valuable experience for a lot of these racers. Oh, because I mean, it's the thrill of winning, right? Like obviously, these guys love to compete. That's why they're in a position that they are in. The adulation you get from the crowd right there as well. Shouts to the crowd, making some noise for our winners and all our competitors. You love to see it for Strike. That's just got to be a good feeling. Like, I am not just somebody who brings the heat online. Like, you could put me in a live setting like this, and I will thrive, excel, and obviously win. And Strike just really dominant as well, too, Bear. I mean, it's hard just to win one race with this type of talent, but we saw him win a handful of races. And let's go ahead and check out the final standings from our Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Championship Cup 2022. As we mentioned, Strike will be at the top of your leaderboard. A dominant 20-point victory, but how about... GNB 75 in second, and Adam and N tying for third place. I think wow. they might do one extra course in the back to figure that out at that point. But <laughs> awesome to see just how competitive things were there, Bear. Yeah, you, it's, I, I had a feeling that we're going to have a point differential uh, among the top four going into here. Because given that if once one person gets their front running and gets away, they're going to be able there. It's wonderful to see strike. Place 93 points out of the maximum, I believe, 120. So it was quite really good uh, placements for all, for all the striking here. Well, let's racing. take one more look at our champion, Strike. Strike with 93 points. Yes, sir. Dominant. Looked effortless at times. There you see being awarded that Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Championship Cup trophy. Go ahead and put that up. Those are rare to get right there, EE. -E. Oh, you, I'm telling you, man. You can, you can go ahead and just hang your jersey up next to it, too. <laughs> just remember. I mean, this is a moment, too, for a lot of these guys. Like, even if you didn't necessarily win, you know, Strike obviously being our, our champion here, you're going to remember that. It's going to stick with you for a long time to come and probably for the rest of your life because moments like this, they don't come easy. And Strike, he fought hard for it. He won in a dominant fashion, and that's something to definitely hang your hat on. And, Bear, one thing you pointed out is coming into this weekend, a lot of these racers knew of each other online, but things changed when they saw each other in person. And over the course of the last couple of days, there were some bonds that were certainly made. Yeah, definitely a lot of a lot of new newfound friendships, understanding each other. They've formed up a lot almost every every other night. Just kind of understanding, like, oh, you know, we're actually human beings and we're playing Mario Kart 8 Deluxe <laughs> at PAX. This is wonderful and and on this stage itself. So it's been really nice seeing that. It's a whole different experience when you're playing in person with someone in Mario Kart. It's a lot more fun. You know, you can you can have a bit of banter. You can also, you know, try out some new things that you may not be able to do online. What would you say to somebody watching this right now that is thinking about getting into Mario Kart 8 Deluxe competitively? What would be a word of encouragement, or where do they get started on their journey? Uh, honestly, when it comes down to it, is finding your 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 local area that will probably want to run land tournaments like a lot of people will run land tournaments here and there um the biggest thing is on is dipping your toes online at first you know going to regionals worldwide is fine to get your dip your toes kind of see how you feel see if you like that pressure because it is a pressure when you're playing any game competitively Mario Kart alone you're going to have 80 80 percent skill with racing and 20 percent luck so you just want to Keep that in mind if you're trying to get into this game competitively. That, that's going to be like that. That'll do it for the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Championship Cup 2022. For E.E. E. Bear and our wonderful crew, I'm Jordan Kent. Thanks again for joining us. Stick around in just a few moments. We'll bring you the Splatoon 3 Enter the Splatlands Invitational 2022. You do not want to miss that.
We'll be back in just a moment.
Are you ready? We are bringing you the Splatoon 3 into the Splatlands Invitational 2022. Coming your way from PAX West, I'm your head spray-by-spray -spray host, Jordan Kent, and joining me, two casters that have been there since day one. Gentlemen, live audience, Splatoon 3, what are you excited for? Everything! This game, we have waited for five years for this game to come out. We have been so excited all throughout, and finally, we will get to see what the best players in the entire country can show us here before the game is even released. Joined by Nine and Shiny and Shiny, this has obviously been a day you counted down on your calendar, marked off every single day. We have some of the top teams in the U.S. here. What are you most looking forward to? You know, it's rare to have so many high-level teams in such an early state of the game where they're able to try out these builds early and really test the limits of what this game can offer. So to have the talent that we have available here with some players hitting 3,000 XP in Splatoon 2, it's only a matter of time before we see what they can do in Splatoon 3. Let's go ahead and check out the early bracket as we get set to crown a champion here today. We are still going to find some seeding here in some turf war. And as you see, our mini bracket, teams battle in a mini bracket to determine seeding order for the semifinals. It'll be turf war. There's are five of your new stages as well too. Stages can only be played once. And as we mentioned, we've got four of the top teams in the US. And for more on that, we turn to another member of our team, Ashley Esqueda. And Ashley's gonna have more on these squads that'll be competing in the ink here today, Ashley. And as we continue to wait for Ashley here in just a Lee second, toast, as we get you're excited, the team captain. here she is. How are you feeling about your team? Honestly, I feel really confident. Because when we were playing a little earlier, we all got the handle of the game pretty down. And uh, we're feeling pretty uh, good with our chances of uh, you know, winning the tournament. Brand, how are you feeling about your team's chances here? Feeling pretty confident. I think that going into this tournament, we've been known as the best team in the Western scene across both North America and Europe. And we're looking to continue that streak here. Bagel, uh, Splatoon 3, new game. What is your favorite new special? Mine would definitely have to be the ink vacuums, mainly because I really like the utility it has. It was really fun to use. Synapse, what is your favorite part about Splatoon and the community it's built? Because it's kind of a special thing, right? Yes, I think honestly, is the content that is being pushed out in the game because in Splatoon 1 there wasn't that much content being pushed out and nowadays almost everyone's getting in the hang of making content for YouTube and it brings the community more together than before. On the count of three, I would just think about it really quick, which team is going to win this tournament and when I count to three I'm going to point at you and you can all say it together, okay? One, two, three. Jackpot. Super, Super B! Jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, can we redo the last one? <laughs> <laughs> Super P. Oh, very good. Who is your favorite member of Deep Cut? Shiver. Big Man. Big Man. Shiver. Big Man. Obviously Big Man. <laughs> big Man. Big Man. <laughs> okay, well, that's unanimous. I will, I will accept this as your answer. We all love Big Man. We will be bringing you more. Check it out. Until next time, catch you later. All right, thank you, Ashley. We will also have Milana joining us here on the casting desk here a little bit later for some semifinal action. But taking a look at these teams here, let's go ahead and start with our first team as we get set for a seating round here. Super P here, Nine, what stands out to you about them? I mean, Super P is one of the true pickup heroes of this. A lot of the teams that are competing today do have established time. This is not one of those teams. They were players who pushed their individual unique weapons about as far as you could back in Splatoon 2. One player I want everyone to keep track of at home is Synapse, been piloting that 52 gal in all three Splatoons and one of the very best to do it. And Shiny, obviously Starburst is a team that has got some names that have been very well known over the last few years in the Splatoon competitive community here. Some freaks of nature on that team that really their name alone just scares you into submission in a lot of these cases. Ice is one of the most impressive anchor and backline players that I've seen. And word is that they may return to that charger status that they were very well known for in the early Splatoon 2 life cycle. But when you have slayers like Bran as well on your team, you really have to be careful wherever you go. And Nine, everybody had a chance to dip their toes into the ink pools with the Splatfest last week. But now this is our first chance seeing 10 new specials in ranked mode, and that relationship between special and objective is going to be on full display today. Absolutely, and even in Turf War, where your objective is the entire map, there are still certain specials that are absolutely stronger here, and 
I hope you all are thirsty, because I'd wager we're going to see a little bit of Tacticooler here today. <laughs> and obviously, it's, it's just a matter of how these specials have now changed the way that you approach the game here, Shiny. It really feels like that these specials are very committal, and it's going to force you to engage with the opposition. You know, I've heard lots of talk about the specials, how many of them feel fresh and new. You know, in Splatoon 3, there are 15 specials, which is technically the same number as Splatoon 2. But when you factor in that five of the specials in Splatoon 2 were actually different bomb launchers, mm. there really is so much more variety in this game that you have to choose from. And then obviously, Nine, looking at all the different weapons you can go with, the early report from these players is that everything feels good, that it really feels like it's not just going to be a bunch of people running around with shooters, that it's opened things up again for your chargers, for your blasters, which is great news for a lot of folks. It really is. And the lack of ink armor from Splatoon 2 coming into Splatoon 3 means that a lot of those weapons that could take you out in maybe one shot but could sometimes indirect, it means they're a lot better now. And that's why I'm really excited. I think today we're going to see some great variety, and we're going to see a lot of people go with their true comfort picks instead of what they think might be best. And Shiny, when it comes down to Turf War, especially at this level, so many of these players talk about the final 30 seconds being huge. You know, there's an ability that's basically built around the last 30 seconds. It's called Last Ditch Effort, and that is going to be a critical piece of many of these players' gear going into the tournament. They're only going to have main abilities at their disposal today, so picking those is going to be that much more important. And then we also have one more ability that we'll get to here in just a second, but Mincemeat Metalworks, and here we go, Turf War, Super P versus Starburst and Nine. What can you tell us about this particular map? Already, Mincemeat Metalworks, the first thing you're going to notice here, all of these grates that you can run over, you can't turf on top of them, you can't swim across them here. It means that if you are able to get your anchor player like Ice on this spot that you see Biscuit, it's going to be that much more difficult to get rid of them. You see Biscuit with the dualies. What else can you tell us, Shiny, about these loadouts? It's an interesting choice for both teams. Man, the Aero Spray is such a Turf War classic. It's going to have the Reef Slider, which is a great special that allows you to launch yourself forward and detonate it early if you want to. As we see an early pick off there, the Crab Tank, another new special, was at the ready, but it's going to be Taco from Super P taking them down. And already Super P with a couple of splats to get this started here. You see Taco at the top losing a teammate. 4-3 advantage. Starburst on the map. Here is Juan, and really mid here, Nine, is a lot more crowded than what they're typically used to. Oh, it absolutely is, and look at this, all the pressure, they're running forward immediately, and the pressure's still not done. Ice has moved up, Biscuit has moved up, that's going to be a delayed wipeout here, and Starburst playing with all the confidence in the world thus far. Biscuit dropping down below, you see this crab tank ready to roll, retreating, trying to find a little bit more space, pairs up with Bagel, Ice, they are bunched up there right now, Shiny, but here comes the crab tank. Starburst really has the advantage here. Their anchor roll is going to be that heavy splatling that Ice is using. The Crab Tank going to finish off one as they get the final shot there. And you also notice at the top there that Wave Breaker. That's going to give them some extra added advantage. You don't have things like Tenor Missiles right now calling out the enemy position, and that's where the Wave Breaker comes in. Biscuit being mindful. You see that Suction Bomb going there to claim a little bit more territory, trying to cover some more ink and nine. Here comes the Encroachment, and you see Synapse here with that Trizuka trying to keep him at bay. Yeah, but it's only Synapse there. As that was going on, everybody else had gone down and look at this again they've maneuvered so well here you've seen biscuit go to this exact spot rotate back to the middle and now look at that they've swapped off again giving each other high fives as they go about and you see the advantage is for starburst just over a minute left four on four on the map currently and at this point here shiny you see the killer whale 5.1 coming out what can super p do to try and get some momentum first of all the killer whale is one of the only global specials that you have in the game it's also one of the only ways to target the enemy team with your reticle but we also saw the triple Ink Strike come out. That was the Slosher, and that's one of the best things that you can have in the last minute of a Turf War match, because it gives you great coverage of the map, especially when you're down. Nine, how about Biscuit hunting out the Splat and the Crab Tank? The Crab Tank's so versatile. It's got two ways of firing. You've got a long-range, uh, just series of shots that you can apply, and then you've also got a true blob here, and Brand gonna go with the Trizuka. Almost gets another one there. One not bad. Oh, Brand doing a great job of opening things up. Under 30 seconds left. Brand one on one gets one. Here it comes, Brand trying to approach a little bit closer, trying to pick off Taco, trying to move away to the side, gets splatted and. Zach, here's an opportunity for Super P with a numbers advantage. Brand's devious run has come to an end. The tricky thing about that Trizuka is that if you don't get those shots fired oh, up right away, we have a three down situation one as well. Speaking of trying. Is it enough? We'll see. A light push by Super P. Maybe they took the game. That's a lot of teal. Let's get the result. It is Super P getting the win at the end. And nine. That is why you don't give up. You see the look of disbelief 
on their side. I think I heard their call-outs and their screams all the way from up here, and there's about 20 <laughs> rows of people here. That's why we say it's the last 30 seconds that matter here. That entire time, they were getting pushed back, pushed back. All it takes is one overextension, one combination of specials that are able to take a couple people down. Eventually, they had to move back, and they did not look back. And Shiny, it really felt like when Brand went down, that's when things collapsed for Starburst and Super P. Taking advantage of the situation, we mentioned the final 30 seconds, so key. Well, even in Turf War, you have to realize that the aggression in this game is kicked up many more notches than it is in Splatoon 2. Having map control is so important to allow your Slayer to do what Brand was doing up until that point when they went down. So that gives Super P so much more room on top of the ink that they were able to garner with that triple ink strike to move forward and finally get the lead at the last second. And that is a huge victory for Super P. And confidence-wise, Nine, that you have to feel great being able to turn the tide that late in the match. Yeah, it's especially with the way that the game had been going. It was all Starburst that entire game. They were pushed back. They were rotating around. So whenever you as a team are able to deal with that for two minutes and not lose confidence and say, we just need to get one or two down and then we can execute our game plan, that is mental fortitude at its finest and at the highest level. Let's go ahead and check out the bracket after Super P steals one away from Starburst at the end. And now Super P one-on-one, -on -one, Starburst 0-2. Oh That'll bring up the Mad Titans and Jackpot next. And obviously, this plays a huge role because this is the seeding for semifinals. And when you get to those ranked modes, matchups are huge here, Shiny, as you get set for really taking on these teams for a best of five here in just a moment. But we're going to meet our other two teams. Our very own Ashley Esqueda sat down with them. Kyo, you're the team captain. How are you feeling about the team's chances? Uh, feeling pretty good. I never like to underestimate any team, so I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, we're going to win. But, like, you know, we're going to try our best and we're probably going to, you know, we're going to win. Perfect. Well, I'm, I'm excited to watch you play. I'm excited to watch all of you play. Q, this is a first-time experience for a lot of players here in the Invitational. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you're preparing for the tournament? First off, I'm going in with a ton of confidence, and I feel like if you don't have that, then you're going to get really nervous on stage. And I think that's like the most important thing, especially when you're playing in front of a really big crowd. You know, you have to be able to control your nerves um, when you go up there. Legend, tell me a little bit about your favorite special in Splatoon 3. The crab, I just like, I do, I'm, there's really no reason I just like the crab. That's why I can't really like. Do you need a reason to like the crab? I don't think you do. I just, I just like the crab, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Dude, it's literally like, I guess I tried out the special and I just liked it. it That's crab. perfect. I'm looking forward to seeing you deploy that crab tank during the tournament. Okay, last question on the count of three. I want you to say what team you think is going to win this tournament. Are you ready, Mad Titans? Okay, one, two, three. DNA. That is not your team name, but I will take it as an answer. We will be bringing you more Splatoon content. Be sure to stay tuned, and until next time, catch you later. Thank you, Ashley. By the way, guys, uh, I think Legend likes the Crab Tank, to be honest, if you, if you look at his favorite special here. But, you know, you look at Mad Titans and Jackpot, and obviously two teams, nine, that were very well experienced, especially in the Inkopolis Showdown qualifying for this event. Yeah, they did a great job, and both of the tournament runs that they made in their victories were quite dominant. And these are teams that have competed against each other so many times. There's some amalgamation of these players here, so I'm not at all surprised to see both teams say that they're very confident. And then, of course, when you look at the loadouts and the makeups of these teams, there's a lot of balance that goes into it, Shiny. They're not just selecting any weapon for any random reason. They're very strategic in the way that they assign their roles to their teammates. Very meticulous, almost. You know, in, in Turf War, you have to be very careful about over-relying on the different roles that make ranked so crucial and a much longer stint than these sort of sprint-esque Turf War matches. So maybe you have like your traditional anchor, your slayer, your, your utility player. That utility and farming up those very important ink getting specials becomes super critical, especially again in those last 30 seconds. What is most unique to both of you, and let's start with you, Nine, about player movement in Splatoon 3? Because there's going to be some changes as this meta continues to develop here next week. Yeah, so the big thing here, and it really applies to blaster players in particular, but with that new squid roll that you can do, it does push your character either far left, far back, far forward, but when you do that, it does actually push your shot a little bit further. So if you're a blaster player or a slosher player, that means you can pressure the opponent mm. from spots that you couldn't normally. 
And Shiny, we're going to take a look at the Mad Titans, as we mentioned, some powerhouses there that have championship experience. And, you know, this is a different stage, and you want folks that are familiar with this. And what really stands out to you about what they're able to do once they get on the same page? This is the introduction of the old guard to the new guard. I think Kyo has been a very dominant sort of anchor player that not only takes that role, but out of the game takes a very like captain, vocal, call out style role. And if you have a player like Zero at your disposal as well, who frankly hasn't been playing that much, but came back into the game like nothing had ever happened, like, it, like they had never left, honestly. And Nine, I want to go back to the specials in Splatoon 3 because I think that's the thing so many people are excited mm -hmm. to see how they will interact with these objectives and rank modes. And obviously you talk to the players, there's going to be a lot of strategies we're going to see for the very first time here. Absolutely. And I'd say the word that you used earlier, Zach, that was so great is committal. How committal these specials are because in Splatoon 2, you had a number of global specials. Ink Armor, Tenta Missiles, Stingray. You could displace the opponent and then go in, decide where you wanted to attack from. That's not going to be the case here. If you want to use your specials, you're going to have to be a bit more honest, a bit more committal. And more than anything, you're going to have to be creative. And Shiny, on that note, how do teams best make pushes now in Splatoon 3? Because as we mentioned, you don't have those global specials anymore. How are teams going to utilize their specials to try and take momentum in some of these ranked modes? Well, there may not be one true formula. It's very map dependent. There are maps that are a lot wider. There are maps that are quite narrow and have longer sight lines, but also sort of cubbies placed throughout the left and right hand side. So if you're a longer range weapon, maybe if there's a bridge, which a lot of these maps do have some sort of overhang, whether it's grading or bridges, maybe you set up there or maybe you select a weapon that allows you to get back into the action quicker, like having the tacticaler or maybe even the squid beacon. Let's check out Jackpot. They're hoping for all three sevens to pop up here today, Nine. And for Jackpot, a team that you're very familiar with, a team you're excited to see out here. Absolutely. This is a team of absolute juggernauts who have moved through. They have competed at the highest level, both against North American, European, Japanese teams here. And one player that I want to highlight is Q. She was speaking earlier here. At the end of Splatoon 2, a lot of Charger players moved away from Charger, moved to Splatlings, moved to Jet Squelters. Not Q. She stuck with the Chargers the entire time, and I'd wager that with as strong as that weapon is looking currently, she's going to be rewarded. And obviously, Shiny, with no ink armor in Splatoon 3 as of right now, that changes things for Chargers completely. It changes things dramatically. You don't have a lot of that built-in, you know, sort of defensive capabilities. On the flip side of that, though, the Splat Charger slash Splatter Scope was given the Ink Vac Special that allows you to play what I would call an offensively defensive role. It allows you to get right into the action. In the ranked modes, I think we'll see this even more, but it allows you to take the fire that a lot of your Slayers and Skirmishers are going to be getting and allows you to dish out that damage right back to your opponent. Now, now we got to get to the new weapons, of course. You take a look at what's going to be at the repertoire. I mean, some people have really been excited by this Platana so far also. Yeah, it is a very pesky weapon. I think that's the best way that I can put it here. <laughs> it's a weapon that likes to play at close range, but it moves very quickly when it charges here. And I think we all sort of underestimated exactly how quick it would be when it was doing that. We did see a couple of the players in the scrimmages that we played a couple days ago actually utilize it here. I think it's going to take a while for them to really pick up the true strength of it. But boy, oh boy, is it hard to pin down. And then finally, the aggressive players, your frontliners here, Shiny. What have you noticed in the last couple of days and a lot of the feedback from the Splatfest? Has anything changed for those frontline players as far as their approach? You know, taking my own opinion of the Splatfest where I was like, oh, the splatter shot really feels good. The dark tetra dualies, for example, you can sort of roll around and you also have the, the squid roll that gives you even more mobility. A lot of the players today are sort of falling back on old favorites, things like the 52 gal and of course that splatter shot I just mentioned. Mad Titans taking on Jackpot in Hagglefish Market and another map here, Nine, that folks are excited about and what can we expect here? Yeah, this is one of the widest maps in Splatoon 3 right now. You can see at the top and bottom of the screen here a lot of cubbies, as Jack so adroitly put it. Ways to attack the opponent that they're not expecting. And already, Shiny, we see a Tentabrella coming out for the Mad Titans. Yeah, I want to honor Nine for this one. Nine was very big on the Tentabrella being a huge thing. That's another one of those weapons that's going to give you ink back. It's also the only weapon available today as we see a great uh, Exuka shot that has that Squid Beacon. If you want to get back into the action, that's the weapon that you have to pick today. Leafy with that Trizuka, but has to eat a Crab Tank to the face. And all oh, that is a wipeout already for the Mad Titans, Nine. And it's amazing in that first 30 seconds, you saw both of their game plans. Jackpot immediately built up the Tacticooler, ran forward and tried to push them down. Meanwhile, the Mad Titans had built up two specials to counteract, and they are rewarded with the first wipeout. 
Take a look at Burt right now, letting that Tenta Brella just go ahead and move forward and create some space. Plenty of options here right now for the Mad Titans, playing a little bit more defensively here at the moment, Shiny. All four specials at the ready. They end up using the Tactical or the Triple Ink Strike and also the Splat Duelies as well. Their four specials going to come out and it's going to be the Ink Fact. You can see how condensed the fight is. Oh. It's going to be two members down there for the members of Jackpot, trying to force them all the way back. A couple of people go down. Token going to finally clean things up, but that was not easy for either team. Token with the double splats. That's a 4-3 advantage for Mad Titans on the map at the moment. Just under a minute 40 left. And so far after that initial surge, you love the way the jackpot is stabilized through nine. Yeah, they've done such a great job of sticking together. Kind of a little jab and poke style of gameplay. And this is what they've done for years here. The way that they've tried to do it here. Taking a dive here. Once again, it's always 2v1s. Textbook right there, Jordan. 4-2. Jackpot. They're trying to move things forward. Trying to cover... All sorts of turf, but then they go down. All of a sudden, Mad Titans bouncing right back. This is what you expect to see from them here, Shiny. The ability to take a little bit of a dip and then bounce right back. Kyo is certainly no stranger to the special. As we see a great shot there in the Trizuka coming out. The members of Jackpot are trying to spawn to the members of their team that are in mid, but they're not going to get very far as it's a 3v3 on both sides. And we have a pretty even amount of ink as we enter the last minute here. Kyo trying to use that slosher and move forward. Kyo picks up a splat. Let's go ahead and take a look at Burt. And Burt right now just being a little strategic, building that special here, Nine. Yeah, right now the penalty for going down is so much bigger than trying to make a hero play here. Burt has stayed in the middle and been the stabilizing force for them in the entire game. Token moving back, needs to be careful not to get run up. Q came back and was able to get a huge pick once again. Oh, Token dancing left and right around the ink, picking up the splat against Leafy. Here's Madness in the middle, gets splatted. 2-2, under 30 seconds left. Who will have the final push? Shiny. Jared going to have to do some work in a 1v2 trying to back up. Yeah, not much can shut down Q there, but it was the triple ink strike that ended up taking her down. And we see the tactical are coming out. That's going to be two down on the side of Mad Titans as we have a full white belt oh, on the side of Mad Titans. Is the juice bar enough at the end from the tacticooler? We shall see. How about Jackpot at the end? Another late surge, second game in a row. I don't know. I see a lot of purple out there, Nine. And, and it that'll go the way of Jackpot. I mean, both of these games, what a treat it's been. Unable to tell who was truly in control into the last 15 seconds. And that entire game, Burt on the Tentabrella had been the stabilizing force, letting the other members jump in. As soon as Burt went down, the floodgates opened up. And what an incredible victory for Jackpot. How about Jackpot down the stretch? We mentioned Tactic Cooler is one of those specials. Every team is going to run here, Shiny, and you see the impact it can have especially late in the game. It's amazing how many parallels we can draw from just two best of one turf war matches. Only three minutes long, and we can still see how important it is to have one of your main role players that are in the action right in the middle of the map go down. It's a snowball effect that snowed all the way through on Mad Titans, giving Jackpot the win there. And that goes to show you, you just can't give up down the stretch. You never know what's going to happen as well, too. So obviously, this is a big win for Jackpot. We'll go ahead and take a look at the results here in just a moment. But two big surprises down the stretch as well, too. And Jackpot, the only team to go 2-0. That'll put Mad Titans underneath them, Super P, and then Starburst at the bottom. So we will get set to set the semifinals bracket, which will be ranked mode which will be really really fun because then it'll be best of five and here we go jackpot versus starburst in our first semi-final mad titans versus super p in our second semi-final those four teams will compete for a chance to be in the finals which will be best of seven then of course we'll have one champion for our splatoon three into the splatlands invitational 2022 and before we get to these rank modes here, I mean, obviously, we're excited to see this firsthand, Nine, how they're going to utilize these specials in rank mode. You imagine the strategies. There's going to be a lot of back and forth, especially in between matches. Yeah, the teams are still figuring this out as it goes along, and that's why a tournament like this is so fun. They'll be inventing strategies that we'll be using for years, and they'll do it right here. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Let's go ahead and kick it to Ashley Esqueda as we get set to transition to the semifinals. Thank you, broadcasters. I am down on the show floor here at PAX, and I have, what's your name? Halia. Halia. I love the creativity happening here. You've got some tentacle bottle caps happening in your hair. You're obviously a big fan of Splatoon. Did you play the previous game, Splatoon 2? Yes, yes, I did. And how excited are you for Splatoon 3? I am extremely excited. I keep on checking my email 
of the pre-order every single day and getting a little bit sad that there isn't another email about it. That makes two of us. I do the same thing. Every morning I check. Uh, what are you most excited about using in Splatoon 3? Is it is it the crab tank? Because I feel like, for me, it's the crab tank. Honestly, I'm just excited to try out the different sets for the weapons and just mess around and talk for. That's great. And uh, these players are probably a lot of them playing for the first time in front of a live audience. What do you think they're feeling right now up there on that stage? Uh, they're probably nervous because, like, it's a bunch of people. So it's going to be a bunch of people watching them. If they make a mistake or something, a bunch of people is going to see it. But no pressure. We all make mistakes. Better, truer words have never been spoken. Halia, thank you so much for talking to me. I cannot wait to play Splatoon 3 with you. I will see you on the internet. Back to you guys in the broadcast booth. Welcome back, folks, to the Splatoon 3 Edge of the Splatlands Invitational 2022 Tournament at PAX West. We have had uh, a bit of a change here in the booth. Jordan has opted to take a short break here, our spray-by-spray -spray analyst, but have no fear. We have brought in one of the finest Splatlists in all of the land, Milana. And, and Mel, we've already seen two incredible Turf War games coming down to the last 15 seconds each time. What is your reaction to what we have seen thus far and what we're about to see? You know, at Nine, I would say that I was at the edge of my seat, but I don't think I could even sit down for that. I was down my feet <laughs> watching that. Really, it's just so exciting, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what's going to happen next. Well, these teams have already treated us to a great time. Let's go ahead and pull that bracket back up here so everybody can see what we got to see in that last bit. Of course, at the top side, we're going to be seeing Jackpot 2-0 versus Starburst 0-2. And, and on the bottom side, you're going to see the Mad Titans versus Super P, both teams being 1-1. One one. The ranked modes are on the table right now as we are in semifinals, and we'll go ahead and talk through the rules here. This will be best of five. The higher seed will choose the mode with the lower seed choosing the stage. After the first game, the winning team will choose the mode, and the losing team will choose the stage. The game modes 
Clam Blitz, Splat Zones, Tower Control, Rainmaker, and the stage list. You can see stages can be played only once. We've got Hagglefish Market, Mincemeat Metalworks, Undertow Spillway, Eeltail Alley, and the Scourge Gorge here. So, Zach, I'm going to go ahead and toss this to you immediately because we have been bantering back and forth about Splat Zones. And we know that we will be going here to Splat Zones on Hagglefish Market here. So talk a little bit about the basics of Splat Zones here and how these teams are going to attack it. So if you're new to Splatoon, this is probably going to be the most sensical mode to you from Turf War. There's either going to be one or two zones on the map, depending on what map it is, and you're going to have to entirely cover, or at least as close as possible, to get that zone to start counting down. You start at 100, your goal is to get all the way to zero, and if you allow the enemy team to take that zone over, you're going to be incurring a penalty, so you have to be cautious. And Milana, I want to talk a little bit here about Hagglefish Market as a stage, because we just got to see what it looks like in Turf War. The map doesn't change a ton in Splat Zones. There were all of those different avenues that these aggressive players were trying to attack from. How do you think they'll approach those? Um, they'll definitely have to utilize that a little bit. Um, we, we talked a little bit about it, and you know, Splat Zones on Hagglefish Market is going to be an interesting one because there's a really big Splat Zone right in the middle of the map. Crowd, get hyped! This is your first <laughs> look at Ranked Modes <laughs> in Splatoon 3! <laughs> Jackpot versus Starburst here, fighting it off here. The tournament life on the line. And Zach, what are we seeing here from these team comps? This is honestly the anchor battle I wanted to see. You've already talked up Dot Q or Q on that charger, the splatter scope. But Ice again has opted to go for the heavy splatling, which is going to have the sprinkler great for capping the zone, as well as the wave breaker, which allows you to see where some of the enemy team is hiding. And already, one very important mechanic here. You'll notice that when you hold the zone for a period of time and the opponent takes it back, you do have a slight amount of penalty that you will have to work your way through, meaning that it's always better to get the big points early on. Already a big fight, Q getting a big shot, and Milana right now, Jackpot looks very confident in the way they're playing. They certainly do, but you know, you really can't count out Starburst. Starburst always plays very calm-headedly. They are there, and you know, we see it right here. They're taking the zone back from Jackpot just at least for a little while. And Zach, we talk so often about the lockout phase in this particular mode, and it, whenever one team gets wiped out, it's that much more difficult to move back in. So far, though, it seems like both of the teams playing maybe a little bit tentative, not trying to get into that scenario. Well, honestly, the tactical or make short work of that argument, it's not a breakable special at the current time, so it's something that you can literally plop right in the middle of the zone if you want to. Your entire team gets multiple benefits because of that, and even despite that, Brand continues to do slaying for Starburst. Yeah, Leafy, a very, very bold play there. Try Trying to get Bran as they dropped onto it, but Bran very quickly was able to get that punish. You see Bran continuing to go attack and runs right into two members there. Madison and Jairus going to get the punish, and once again, they have not been able to crack this defense, Milana. Truly, uh, Jackpot is really playing their best game right now, and you know, they're going to have to be very careful, uh, but you know, with two down on the map from uh, Starburst, three down now, it's going to be it's gonna be a tough one for Starburst to come back into. Yeah, you saw there, as we have a wipeout, everybody, our first wipeout in a ranked mode here in Splatoon 3, and it will go the way of Jackpot. You saw that time Ice had moved forward to try to get a couple shots there and got punished for it. Now look at this, the special's coming the other way. That's Attack to Cooler. They are attacking all guns of blazing, Zach. You know, I'm so interested by this Jackpot roster and how some of their rosters, like Jared, they really didn't have to make any changes going into Splatoon 3. They played in Zap in Splat 2, they keep it in Splat 3. But you look at a player like Madness, who's on the 52, what were they running in Splatoon 2? Nautilus, Tri Slosher, Ball Point. This is completely different, and they're still adapting so well. And finally, a bit of pain going through this. Look at this, Jared trying to dance around, and protection coming from Dot Q. And again, another delayed wipe out there. It has been all Jackpot thus far, and this is what we talked about last night, Milana. It is so much more difficult in Splatoon 3 to push back in because you don't have the displacement specials. Definitely. We talked about the localization of these specials. That the new specials, you know, you have to really be up and in the action to be able to utilize them. But we do see that Killer Whale 5.1 coming out, and you know, we did talk about that a little bit earlier, that it is one of those specials that you can use from, you know, your spawn, and it will reach all the way to the other side of the map. And you get the sense this is really Ooh. their last opportunity here. They've melted through that penalty just over 20 seconds left. A big play has to be made. There is a Trizuka here. Brand's going to need to make every single one of these shots count. They do move them. Can they take the zone? It's a fight. It's contested. Will Starburst take it? And they do! A penalty and some breathing room, Zach. Man, once again, we mentioned that the Ink Zuka is so difficult to use. That Trizuka, you really have to fire off all three shots in order to get the most out of it. But even just the presence enough of it was enough to back finally Jackpot off of the zone, giving Starburst finally some breathing room. And more than breathing room here, they finally get a chance to have their own lockout scenario here. The difference, you can see how far up Q has already moved. She's trying
trying to get a shot off onto somebody. Counter specials coming out here. These points are starting to tick away very quickly. Jared could make a play on this side. One down, another Trizuka going out, and the points are ticking away, Milana. It truly is, and with only 34 on a... It, this, this is... this. You know, Jackpot's gonna really have to play their best game to get back into that zone. Another fight over the zone! How is it not gone yet? They managed to hold all throughout! Isis moved up, another two frontliners going down. Leafy needs to stay up, Special's coming up. Another wall, just a few more seconds, five. Can they push in? Special's coming in, two, one! It's contested, one point! They're fighting over the zone! Can they hold it? Can they hold through? Everybody's shooting and I don't believe this! A little longer, I'm running out of breath and Jackpot takes it! Jackpot holds through all and with one point left, that's a huge penalty they'll have to work through, Zach. Man, the counter in Zuko, Trizuka was so strong there and you saw Ice backed into that tiny little corner of the splat zone doing everything that he could to stay alive with that heavy splatling. Unfortunately, it was too little too late and yet again, the long tentacles of the Killer Whale 5.1 make their mark for Jackpot. And now with just 20 seconds left, that's going to be a huge pick from Jared. That's another one going down. Brand needs to find someone here. You see Bagel pushing up as well. This is a huge mountain that Starburst is going to have to climb here and that's if they can even take the zone. Eight seconds left. They've done what they need to thus far, but now everybody going down could be big. That's two down. He was going to pull out the ink back here. They're holding. They're fighting. People are going down, and we are in overtime. We are, and you know, with the, these picks coming out from Jackpot, Starburst is going to have to play their best game. They are holding on to that zone. The penalty is ticking down. We are going to see the best of the best right here fighting out for that zone right now. A, a huge flank, another pick coming out here. Just 30 seconds left on this penalty. You can see the overtime tick at the start. They're going to continue to hold and fire. No room for error at this point. Two specials going down. They try to push. That's three down. That's a full wipe. And Jackpot will take game one of this best of five. And Yo, oh my god. Yo, if that is what game one of Splatoon 3 looks like, <laughs> what in the world are we going to get for the rest of this? You might not have any more breath by the end of this night. I am already out. I have had so much honey, so many cough drops, and yet I don't think it's going to be enough. And I mean, where do we even begin here? Both teams had moments where they really worked that lockout phase of the game. All the other members were trying to come out of spawn. And when the game is 10 to 11, clearly they both did it. But throughout the course of that game, you got the sense that Jackpot was able to separate the members of Starburst mm -hmm. and attack. And Zach, we talked so much about that. The way and the weapons that Jackpot likes to go, we thought would really fit well. And I think so far we've been proven correct. Well, flanking is always going to be a thing. It's it's one of the tenets of Splatoon in general. But when you're facing an ink vax that's sitting just right behind the zone, and you're trying to use every special that actually paints at your disposal with a tacticaler permanently sitting next to the zone, and you still can't do anything, what are you supposed to do at that point? It helped break down Starburst's aggression, and that allowed Jackpot to really hold on there at the last possible second. And Milana, we have just heard here over the comms that we will be going to Tower Control next. So Tower Control, a mode that people are very familiar with, has been with us since Splatoon 1. What are these teams going to need to do, and what are the basics of this mode? So Tower Control requires you to stand on this tower, and while the tower is moving through some checkpoints, um, in this game, it's a little bit different than in Splatoon 3. Uh, sorry, in Splatoon 2, sure. we have three checkpoints instead of one or two. So uh, the, the teams have to stand on this tower and maintain control of the tower as the, the timer is ticking down and make it pass through these checkpoints to be able to move that tower into kind of the enemy zone. Absolutely. And, and Zach, we're going to be a broken record here, but we cannot talk about specials on this mode without talking <laughs> about the ink back. So I'm going to give the floor to you here. I think on paper you all can figure out why something that eats other specials, bombs, and main weapons can do it. But again, just what is it going to look like when they get up there with that special? You know, I want to tie two specials together. You first have the ink back, and that, for your charger players like Q, that's going to be a blessing for the rest of their team because they can get up onto the tower where normally they would be back somewhere on a plat trying to hit shots and they can be right in the action helping to push the objective. You really only need one player on the tower. You can have multiple, but one is fine. Mm -hmm. And another special that will really help that effort is something that we haven't seen a lot of yet and that is the big bubbler, which is only available on a couple weapons today, but I think those weapons are going to start to dominate. Yeah, and let's just, I mean, talk about those weapons. The blaster being the one that if you've got a blaster, bring it out to tower control, everyone. It's great fun here. But the blaster, Milana, when we were playing in scrimmages against these teams, every one of them said, oh, wow, this feels very strong. 
Yeah, certainly. I think what's really strong about the blaster, if you're unfamiliar with the game, is that it kind of has a pop. And this pop, uh, really, you can, you can hit a lot of players around this exploding radius. So um, if everyone is on the tower and you have something like that, it makes it very difficult to avoid. Yep, when you cannot aim like myself, of course we do go with the blasters for this exact thing, but we are going to be going to Undertow Spillway, and if, if the theme of these maps has been very narrow, this is the narrowest of the mm. narrow here, you're going to notice here that the teams will have to rush to the center where the tower is at, and there's not going to be much maneuverability. The teams are going to get into the match right now here. Come on, crowd, I know you've still got a lot of energy left. This is only game two. Come on, we're going to be going with our first match of tower control here in Splatoon 3. As the teams load in, surprise, surprise, we've got the blaster, Zach. As if by magic, both teams <laughs> deciding that the big bubbler is enough and strong enough to bring with them. Technically, it's on three weapons that are available today, including the ever-popular Splattershot Jr., but the blaster, with that new ability intensify action, it's just too good to pass up. Again, you're going to see a fight here in the center. Both sides trying to see if they can make a big play with their blasters and open it up. Immediately, it does look like Starburst is going to have that first opening, pushing up here, and this is where these maps really start to open up, Milana. There are so many ways to attack. Definitely. And, you know, especially on this map, we do have these overpasses kind of on the left and the right sides of the map. And with this, mo this mode, tower control, um, we see that first checkpoint is very close to the center of the map, so it really leaves you kind of in a vulnerable position. Immediately here, they're trying to attack the center, but Ice has been over at this side. A great placement of that new special, the Wave Breaker right there. You're going to have to jump over. It's just Q now who opts to jump all the way back. So the way Starburst is attacking night and day from that last game, you see they're going to try to shoot up there, see if anyone will jump down. The second checkpoint, they're already at 20 points, Zach. I think the Wave Breaker is a great example of how well a special can be balanced even early in this game. It's breakable, but it's one of the few ways that allows you in the current build of the game to find your opponents. As we see a great splat there, ends up being a kill there by Bagel or a splat rather, and it's going to be a 3v3 situation as Bran unfortunately will go down just before building up again one of those only global specials. Yep, and that was actually a huge pick, as you noted there, by Pagel as Biscuit gets taken for a ride by Q. I was about to say that they still had good control of the middle of the map, which would allow them to maybe set up a good defense here. Now, I'm not so sure. Look at this positioning that Q is taking, Milana. Yeah, Q is really pushing up and making it very difficult for Starburst to make that pushback. Q, being a strong, incredibly strong charger, is not going to miss her shots. Blaster going down here. That was their lead attacker here. Now Q has moved up here with this ink vat. It's going to be that much more difficult for them to push. You see Q going to fire it, and Brand needs to be careful very <laughs> cleverly, was on the other side of the tower and will survive. Q is going to get run down there. A successful defense this time by Jackpot at the start as they've once again traded blows, Zach. Yeah, again, a lot of the fight is still taking place in mid here, and because of the layout of this map, the Blaster really does excel at being able to peek over these kind of tilted hallways and walls to be able to allow you to see where the enemy is and hit them for chip shots even before you see them and their location. And Milana, as we have kind of a scrum in the middle here, so often the order of operations in tower control is where is the opposing backliner, where is their charger, and what can I do to get rid of them here? How they try to pressure Q has been important. She has not moved from that spot since this push started. De yeah, Q, wow. <laughs> we just see just another really nice pick from Q, and she is really going to be that key member of Jackpot that, you know, Starburst is going to have to look out for. They've done a great job here once again of getting back to mid. Two minutes left on the clock here. Biscuit going down very early means the blaster will be out of the way, and Ice needs to be careful there. That is in range. A flank coming from this side, and Q moved around. If someone can get over there and assist, they might be able to do it, but no. Ice has pivoted on the other side. Takes out Q and Jared for good measure. Madness going to try to attack, but I think that this is going to be a delayed wipeout. Another successful defense for Starburst, Zach. You know, something that we haven't mentioned about Q's kit is that they're actually running Respawn Punisher on their clothing, which for a Sniper is great because you don't plan to be going down a lot, but you plan to get a lot of splats. So that's going to delay the time in which they respawn. But unfortunately, if they go down, that's also going to delay it for them as well as we see a beautiful wipeout coming in from Starburst on the other side. Starburst has hit their stride here. One of the best attacking teams in all of Splatoon 2, and they have clearly shown that they can do it here again in 3. You can immediately see the whale being fired at Q, getting her out of that power position. They're going to try to hold mid here, and honestly, Milana, it looks like they might almost be content to simply leave the tower here and not try to push for more than they can get. And you know what? That is totally valid. It is a great strategy that if you know that you can keep control of that middle and you're in the lead, who's to say you need to push anymore? 
Here we go. One minute left. The Tactical are out. Two people are going to grab it here. You get the sense that this is the big push. They have the big bubbler as well that they'll be able to throw on this tower if it comes to it. We've said so much about Q, but Ice on the other side is going to fire Madness off to try to take out Ice there. Needs to be careful, though. That's the big bubbler gone, and that was a big, big gamble, Zach, to try to get rid of Ice. You know, if you're Ice, you look at Jackpot and you see, okay, they're kind of moving like a school of piranhas. They move together. They. It's very rare that you can pick one off separately, and for a weapon like the Heavy Splatling, that's going to allow you to sort of spray and pray in a manner to get multiple hits on multiple enemies to allow the rest of your team to finish them off. And this, the final 20 seconds here, every time that somebody goes down, it's going to be that much more difficult. That's two down with just about 10 seconds left. Biscuit is going to get taken down by Q. Well, you're going to see Bagel's shark around here. The Wave Breaker is down. They're going to put as much damage as they can on the tower. Q is up there with the ink back. This is how it starts, but with just one second left, Bagel tried to steal the game here. And hold on a moment here. That's one down. Biscuit is by the tower. Can they get to it? Ice goes on it. And a great counter punch there by Starburst to even this set one one, Milana. That was just an incredible game. We noticed a lot of really cool things that was happening. I, I noticed that Biscuit, even though he was on the blaster, he was sharking a lot, making sure he's keeping an eye out for Q. So, you know, they, they obviously, Starburst knew exactly what they needed to deal with, and they dealt with it. Yeah, and I love the way that Ice was positioning there. We talked so much about Q there. Ice was sitting on the grating on the left side of that map almost the entire game. And Zach, we have talked about the relationship between the Chargers and the Spatlings for years now. We've been talking about it <laughs> since Splatoon 1. The mobility of the Splatlings there and being able to go on that grating, we knew that was going to be a power position, and Ice really proved it to be true. Well, Splatlings and grating go together like peanut butter and jelly, man. They really are just tried and true companions throughout <laughs> each of the three games, and the run speed that you could invest into a weapon like the Splatling and the inherent movement that you have while charging up your weapon, even though you can't really be as evasive swimming around in your ink, it allows you to have devastating power from long range. And of course, with the kit that it has in this game, it's it's quite strong for these modes. And I think that that was the game, Alana, where we truly saw what Tacticooler is going to make this game look like. I promise to you all, the three of us have commentated a great many Splatoon 2 <laughs> games. That was pandemonium there. Everybody coming back. For those of you not familiar, Tacticooler vastly, vastly reduces your respawn time. I mean, you know, you know Team Chaos did win the, the last Splatfest, you know, so <laughs> it, it does make the game quite a bit more chaotic. Well, um, yeah, but, yeah. You know, Tacticooler, it... it really buffs a player. When you when you grab that drink, you have increased respawn, you, oh, sorry, lo, decreased respawn yep. time, you have increased run speed, increased swim speed, and a bunch of other traits that, you know, it is going to be beneficial for you. Yeah, everything in the kitchen sink really is packed <laughs> into this drink, but you talked about chaos here, and I mean, Zach, here's your segue to Rainmaker here. Another ranked mode here. I'll know you either love it or you hate it here. This in Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2 was known as don't make the mistake because the game might end and we will be going to Rainmaker Scorch Gorge nonetheless. You're not kidding. Talk about chaos in a mode. If you want as fast paced of action as Splatoon has to offer, look no further than Rainmaker because one three down situation or full wipe, wipe out in this game is going to provide you with a huge burst of momentum. However, there are some some subtle changes to Rainmaker that I don't think have been really discussed yet in Splatoon 3 with the addition of additional checkpoints that you have to reach, almost like tower control. Some maps have just one, others have two, I believe, but you can swim there and then you have to break that Rainmaker shield all over again. And if nothing else, that might just slow down the pace of play a bit. Yep, and it is worth noting here that you cannot swim the Rainmaker past those checkpoints and continue to score. You will have to dunk it each time that you want to move through. We're going to jump right into the game right now. The teams are ready here, and it is worth noting, Milana, this is a mode that Starburst dominated in Splatoon 2. I think this will tell us a lot about these teams, and I'm sorry, was that a Tri-Slasher? <laughs> that was indeed a Tri-Slasher, Nine. Um, you know, the Tri-Slasher is a really, really strong weapon in this, uh, in this new iteration of of the game, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it's uh, going to change the tide of the game. Taking a look right here again, the team's opting to play it a little bit safe. That first initial pop of the Rainmaker Shield is going to go in favor of Jackpot here. They will be the first ones to attack. The Inkjet going to be fired up, and another Killer Whale 5.1 fired the other way. This is a lot of pressure coming over here, and I'm sorry, wait, that's a checkpoint already. Zach, what is going on? How did Mandis get back there? Mandis went all the way around that block, and as they were so distracted by the Tri-Slosher's Inkjet, were able to pick up a lot of damage and completely distract from the Rainmaker 
and already we have our first dunk on that temporary pedestal. A very, very quick pedestal dunk there, but it's only to 68. Of course, not a winning push most of the time, and you saw very quickly they put up the right specials that they needed on the defensive side. The Rainmaker does go down very, very early here, and right now, got to get out of there. That ink back is going to hit hard. Sharking here in the mid, trying to find another pick on this side. Will not be able to do so. A gamble does not pay off. And once again, Milana, it's Madness who has been making huge waves throughout the start of this game. I mean, Madness is definitely not a player that you want to sleep on. I think with that, you know, the 52 gal, it really is kind of a devastating weapon as we've seen in Splatoon 2 already. Taking a look again. Ice moving up here onto the grading and Q immediately spots him here. This is the battle that we wanted to talk about here. But look at this. They haven't fired at Ice and now Ice has the opportunity to take out Madness. Can Ice get another? It's a trade here, but they have the Rainmaker. Will they opt to push it? It is just Q up and Q does have the ink vat, the best tool for stopping a push. Can it get it done single-handedly? No, they will be able to at least get this first checkpoint here. Immediately, they're gonna move back, try to rally the troops, Zach, but you love to see that response from Starburst. As a quick aside, I love the quality of life and UI change where you can see which player is carrying the Rainmaker on the screen itself. It makes the game flow so well. On the top of that, we have three members going down for Starburst, so Jackpot able to stop that push. Only one point of difference separates these teams now, and it's all because of the addition of those pedestals. And again, worth noting here, for those of you unfamiliar, when you pick up the Rainmaker, you do lose your main weapon. Not a bad weapon, though, is this Rainmaker. Gonna fire it out. Ice caught in a really bad position, still surviving and swimming away somehow. But this is why it's a gamble. You'd love to have control of mid before this pickup happened as we now enter a Rainmaker free zone. This timer is going to tick away very, very quickly. But honestly, Milana, they might be okay with that. They're waiting for Starburst to run at them. And, you know, I think playing a defensive position is always going to be easier, especially in a game as fast-paced as Splatoon, than, someone, than a position that's more offensive. Again, Biscuit firing here, and Jared, a very valid trade there. I did not think that was going to go through. Again, they picked it up here. Manus working on this side. They call out Manus very quick. Again, just barely. Zach, it seems like so many of these pushes are hedging on just one or two of these fights going the opposite way. You know, at the competitive level, picking your battles is really important. Sometimes you don't have that luxury, but when you do, if you're somebody like a tri slosher and you can trade with either their anchor or their mid-range player, that's a trade you'll take 10 out of 10 times. And again, the tri slosher is so difficult for them to push through. Who picks up the Rainmaker is also so important, Milana. We've seen that it's been Bagel this time for Starburst, but it seems like Jackpot, they're content with anybody taking it if it's the best play. <laughs> yeah, we definitely see that. And, you know, we, we've definitely seen a history of support players picking up that Rainmaker. But, you know, if you're good with the Rainmaker, you're good with the Rainmaker. <laughs> And I mean, it, it kind of unbelievable here the way that this is gone. We thought after that explosive opening, Zach, that we would see big, big pushes, but we're still stuck at 68, 69. But look at this. That's a tactical and Leafy diving in. A good decision, I think, to try to make the play. Can I steal a point here to take the lead? They only need one more and they can't get it. The problem is you have these specials like the Big Bubbler that give you such a big advantage and allow your Skirmisher and Slayer players to get that ink ahead of you. But as the enemy team is coming back, once you're out of that Bubbler, you're back out in the open and the advantage of the sight line was in Jackpot's favor, allowing them to stop that push. Wisely playing the Rainmaker there. If you jump the Rainmaker off the side of the map, it sends it back to center and with just one member left, Madness on this 52. That was the right play. Madness goes down here. This should be the lead in a little more. Q gets a shot, but they are going to get it. Only four points, Milana, but it was just enough with 30 seconds left. And, you know, with the way that this game has kind of been a little bit of a stalemate, I think, you know, three points really could make or break the difference. Keep an eye on the top of the screen, everybody. The special's going to be so, so important here. You know that the members of Starburst are going to try to sit back and not make any unforced errors. The ink vac is at the ready. They're going to get it started with the ink jet. Will they be able to run it through? All the fire going through here, and Q is going to fire it. Here it comes. Did they wait too long? And they did! You saw that the members of Starburst were waiting back, but they were not able to call out how many points there were. They should get the opportunity here. They have grabbed it, and we will go into overtime. Keep an eye on the top of the screen. There are only going to have a little bit of time, and if this goes down, Zach, that it's the end of the game, no matter where you're at on the map. Yeah, it's going to come down to Starburst. They've already gotten two picks, and they only ones left of the 52 in the end zap, but they lose in the last second. The last player alive was that end zap, and the end zap able to take them down. I believe that's Jared with the game-saving play.
and Jackpot going to come away with it, uh, despite a pretty solid end push there from Starburst. And uh, would love to think a little bit about how that push that they were able to get that took the lead went. You saw that they started with the Inkjet Milana to push them back, and they followed with the Inkvat to take any fire and protect that Rainmaker. We knew that was going to be a popular strategy, and to see that be what takes game one here on Rainmaker, it's so lovely. I think, you know, it just goes back to that localized special. You know, we, we, ha we have these specials, they're in the thick of the action, and, you know, they're using it to be able to protect that objective and to make that objective move. So it's, I think it's a game changer for Splatoon 3. And, and Zach, <laughs> we've seen three games and they've all been the exact same way. They have been absolute <laughs> nail biters, and this is why it was so exciting to get these four teams, these players here. Whenever you get greatness together and tell them to try their hardest, this is the kind of magic you see. I mean, did we honestly expect anything different after those absolutely insane Turf War matches? <laughs> we had best of one Turf War, and there was still so much explosive fun to be had. The other thing is now we have to go into the only mode which we have not yet played, and that is going to be Clam Blitz, which a nine has undergone some changes, I believe. Yes, some very big changes here. For those of you who are fans of Clam Bits, you will note that it only takes eight clams now to build that power clam. In Splatoon 2, it took 10 of them, now only eight. And the pods around the map that they spawn in will spawn in in groups of three rather than groups of four. So, Milana, I'll pass this over to you. I know Clam Blitz, some people love it, some people love it less. But what do you think that these changes are going to mean for what this looks like at the highest level? I honestly think that it's just going to be really chaotic. I think having all those clams spawn kind of in the middle of the action is really going to make a difference. And, you know, they're going to be fighting for those clams. Yeah, it's going to be, I, I think, a great danger here. And Zach, you and I even noted here when we were talking with the players yesterday, it seems like a lot more clams, at least at the beginning of the game, start by your spawn, which means that these teams are going to build up that very first power clam very, very quickly. The way I read this is you're going to have to work really hard after you break the barrier in order to maintain a push. It may not be as difficult in the early game to find those clams, especially build up a power claim with a two less requirement. But when you actually get the push and you don't have things to jump to necessarily, maybe a big bubbler, but you're not going to have something like a baller, the bubble blower from Splatoon 2, you're not going to have those at your disposal anymore. So it, you're going to have to be that much more cautious when determining when is the best time to push. We have been told that it'll be mincemeat metalworks that will be going going to here so everything we talked about with the grading going to be all the more important here take a look as we get set for our very first look at clam blitz here in splatoon 3 the team comps coming out here all the same coming out from starburst some slight changes here going back to three shooters here from jackpot milana we, we really do love to see those shooters coming back for another pass for splatoon 3 and we already see one member of jackpot going down that early pick for Starburst, maybe uh, giving them a little bit of space to build those clams. And Zach, you immediately pointed to the screen when that happened. The way that Starburst attacked that left side of the map, you knew that they had an idea of how they wanted to take initiative here at the start. That's ideally the best pick you can get at the start. If they're not going to have a tacticaler to initiate with, and your team will, that is a phenomenal start to the game. However, the Killer Whale 5.1 is going to be reaching out for any members that they can find. It's currently a 52v52 battle, as instead they opt to hang on to their Killer Whale, and it looks like Jackpot is waiting for the right time to push as they have slightly fewer clams than Starburst. Keep an eye on the clam counts at the top there. As Zach noted here, you will see 15 and 8, but no power clams yet. They are opting to separate who has power clams here because it makes it that much more difficult. And also, Milana, on that UI, you can actually see who is carrying how many clams. Yeah, and you know, if, if you as a, a, a member in this match knows how many clams the opponent has, you might want to, you know, target them a little bit. Two huge, huge splats here from Bagel. It really seemed like the initiative was starting to go the other way. They're actually going to get a third there, punishing the super jump in. And again, they've opted not yet to attack. But Zach, you get the sense. They are able to sense that now is the time. They're going to try to grab a couple more. If Biscuit is able to get one more of these members in the center, then it could be it. But they might have waited wow. too long. When Q pops the ink back, you know that you as the enemy team have overstayed your welcome. <laughs> your anchor or charger player is one of the better players Ooh. to have that power clam on. And also one of the better players to hit 90s when they're making shots like that. 
And again, look at this. The push had finally started the other way. And now it's Ice saying, anything you can do, I can do better. You got one great shot. I'll get two. The mobility again of the Splatling going to allow Ice to survive that engagement. And the punishment will come through again. Keep an eye on the claim counts. Where is their power claim? They're fighting on both sides. Another assist as these teams, Milana, just don't seem ready to make that first score. I mean, if, if they keep getting picks like this, I, I don't know if they're going to be able to hold on to those clams long enough to make a power clam. <laughs> oh, and the one thing they didn't want to see, the blaster of Biscuit there. They thought that they were safe from the shooter, and they were, but the blaster, no issue there. They're maneuvering around here. Two have gone down, and once again, these teams holding on. Zach, surely we would have seen a score by now. Those jump-ins are so risky. I mean, Jared was practically playing protect the president there, but the blaster hits multiple targets. It won't just hit one there when they're that close together, but it's going to be Starburst who has two power clamps at their disposal, 18 total. They're still pretty far backed off, but they're hoping that this Tactic Cooler and the Killer Whale 5.1 will finally give them an edge. Yeah, this is the one thing about the Tactic Cooler that's a little rough. If you put it back here, you're giving up a lot of map to try to get it there. Thankfully, they did have the Killer whale to at least defend them very very fortunately surviving Ooh. there some punishment coming out the most satisfying sound in the game milana <laughs> truly is um but you really this is just so much back and forth we really don't i don't even know what to predict at this point I mean, again you can see that they're pushed back here nine power clam or nine regular clams rather on the side of jackpot here they haven't been able to push it. you see that jared is sitting on seven of them there and there it goes q passes it down they sense that now is the time but again madness on the 52 going down too early. Yeah, we see the big bubble alert get deployed in mid. That is going to give them a bit of help there. But if you're not in the bubble, that can't do much for you as three go down on the side of Starburst. However, they're somehow able to return the favor and get three down on the side of Jackpot. It really is a tug of war. I mean, Brand may have saved the game right there. All of the momentum was going the other way. And Brand, with that 52 gal, with that splash wall, able to hold on. Once again, Madness going to be souped up here with this tactic cooler. They're going to try to make the push in as we get to just one minute left on the clock. All four members right next to each other. They've stacked two specials. Make it three specials, Milana. This is it. They're going for broke. This is it. They're trying to make this push happen. The Clams basket is just in such an inconvenient position, but unfortunately, Jackpot has two down. Jared next to that tactic cooler, not able to, to make something happen with this Clam. Maybe he can, though. Jared on a huge pick right there and now has the invulnerability of that tactic cooler. Runs forward and an incredible direct by Biscuit once again to push that aside. Ice dancing in the middle with Madness gets taken out. Madness is able to escape, but this power clam gonna go away. And we are at 30 seconds left, Zach, with neither side even having a power clam. I can't tell if Jared is trying to star in the Matrix or bend it like Beckham with those shots on the end zap. They were able to Ooh. get around that block. We see yet another takedown from Q. And I want to point out they swapped away from Respawn Punisher over to Thermal Link, which means if they get tagged, they're gonna be seen by Q. This is it. The ink back is right there. They're going to try to go over these gratings here. Can they find one more special to make this happen with? They're going to fire. That's two down. They're going to try to go on the right side. They fired it this way. Can I shut it down single-handedly? Jared moving, grooving, trying to come up here. There might be enough protection. Jared opts to go back, thinks better of it. This entire time, Starburst not even trying. Can Jared move through? He cannot once again closing the door. But now, wait a minute. There's still no power clam. This one's <laughs> going to disappear. Someone has to win this game, Milana. Um, I, I, I'm so totally at a loss for words. Really, these, these both of these teams are under so much pressure. This is overtime. 100 100. We really, the first team to score a power clam is going to take the victory. Which one is it going to be? I, and this, uh, if we wanted to know what it's going to look like in Splatoon 3, how about this? Both sides giving so much respect. Again, it is Jackpot who is going to make the build here. They're going to try to score this power clam. Jared, you see, has rotated all the way back. This big bubbler should provide Biscuit at least a little bit of defense to figure out how he wants to move in. They're going to stack here on this side. Biscuit waiting there. Can they find a pick? There's two power clams here. It's Bran again with the 52 gal. Is he going to be able to get both? He does. Wow. It's a wipeout. Can they find enough clams? Bran at six. Biscuit at seven. This way you can see them spamming it. Can Biscuit get there? He needs one. The splash wall up. Can he toss it? And they do. <laughs> Going to game five. <laughs> Starburst with the longest game in the history of Clam Blitz gets the victory. All of that time spent on the defense, a wipeout, the presence of mind to grab that many clams, to pass it, spamming this way. And then again, you saw Biscuit could have rushed straight forward Milana and tried to score. Instead, backed up, 
Fran said, I've got a splash wall. Let's take out the one member who can attack. And what a reward for that type of patience in that situation. Having that kind of level-mindedness is just exactly what we expect to see from Starburst. As extremely seasoned professional veteran players, you know, having that calm mind, even in, some, in a situation as high pressure as that, Man, I only wish I could be like them. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, this is unbelievable that we have seen all four of these modes go in this fashion. This is not scripted. I promise to you that this is not scripted here. This is simply what these teams are able to pull out when greatness is required of them. And now, Zach, we do have the opportunity to go back to one of the modes that was played earlier. We played all four modes, and it looks like we'll be going back to tower control. Well, I guess for their comp, it makes a lot of sense. They're, they've been reliant in these ranked games on that big bubbler, and tower control is going to be arguably the best mode that you can go to when you're opting to run that special. Of course, the blaster, part of what was so instrumental in allowing that final push to happen. If you thought the overtimes in Clan Blitz and Splatoon 2 were long, just wait until you get more glances at Splatoon 3. <sighs> I mean, again, I... <laughs> gonna need a little bit more water here with the way that these are absolutely <laughs> destroying my voice but milana you have competed at this level for many many years yourself here competing at some of these nintendo events you know that tower control very very scary especially in a game five why would they go to tower control and also crowd come on this is it this determines who goes to finals here from semis you know i just think that tower control is something that you feel like you have the most control it's in the name control right so I mean, you well, can't put it any better than that. And oh my gosh, Zach, you already pointed out double 52 gal coming out here from Jackpot. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, two is the magic number. The score is 2-2. Two, two. We got the 52 gal, which is a two-shot weapon. And they're going to be bringing in that killer whale 5.1 twice, which is going to be so difficult to match no matter where you are on the map. Both sides trading a member down. Ice is already down here. Important to note, that's a really, really big pick. Now Bran is going to have to try to go back over here and punish again, getting incredible fall-off shots. And now Bran, the other member on the map who's playing this 52 gal, going to go ahead and punish and push Q back in this scenario. Was looking scary there at the start, Milana, but Starburst riding the ship. They definitely are, but you know, still, we, we do see that Starburst take they do take that tower, and that first checkpoint is really not that far from where that tower started. Moving up here, watch out there, Q. It is Biscuit who's going to very wisely and quickly move up here. Another member is here. Hold on a moment. Brand's actually going to go down the punishment again. That's three down, Zach. And now this is the moment that the attack can happen. That's the other one going down, a delayed wipe. And where will Biscuit set up here in a great position to take this push even further? Bagel doing a great job of holding down the tower, popping the tactical, which almost acts as an impromptu shield because it cannot be destroyed. So as you're hiding behind it, it even gives you a little bit of pressure if you're not sitting in that big bubbler. And I'm glad you mentioned Bran, because Bran now has to be better than not one, but two 52 gals as Jackpot gets an entire wipe out. And this was the scary part that we saw so much in our scrimmages with these teams earlier. So easy to attack. When you have a wipeout, you know that it's going to be three specials coming forward in the tactical or makes it four. What is Starburst going to pull together on the defensive side? Nobody went down with those specials. They were very patient and waited. The lead will change, but they are looking for a lot more than the lead here, Milana. They certainly are, and they're moving Moving straight to that last checkpoint, and Starburst is going to have to really pull it together. Uh, but you know, it's uh, you know they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did a great job there. Biscuit was positioned perfectly with that blaster there, and you saw that the members of Jackpot were willing to maybe stay there a little longer than you normally would to try to get through that last checkpoint. Getting through that last checkpoint means that every single push afterwards would have been that much easier, Zach. Yeah, Jared and Bagel sort of being the unsung heroes of these matches. There's always a tactical around when you need it. It feels like two people are playing that special, but it's really just one per side. As we see yet another killer whale going to go out. That's going to help target and find some of the members of Starburst who are dancing and dodging around, trying to build up specials. It looks like most of them are about halfway through and waiting for another opportunity to pounce. Three members of Starburst bunched up there on that right side. That means they're going to give up a lot of ground, and thank goodness Bran respawned in when he did. That was going to get nasty in a hurry. Instead, it's going to go the other way, but all your momentum slowed down for the ink back. Great shots there by Ice, who trades with the ink back. That's not bad at all. Two minutes left on the match. You can see... Brand waiting to push up, Biscuit going underneath and not able to get there in time. Madness with another punish, Milana. And uh, you know, I think like we mentioned before in that earlier tower control match, if they don't have to push up, maybe it's not the best idea to not push up. And well, you see that Jackpot is really just maintaining that mid control and you know, propping Q up on that the, the, the level above and being able to like see all, all the members of Starburst 
I think is a, a great position for her. Identifying where you want to move on the attack, the quicker that you can get it done without communication, the more effective it is, Zach. These players so, so good at identifying where they need to go before the time has come. Look at how narrow these hallways and pathways are. If you're facing three out of eight members in this match have a, a wall at their disposal as we see a double splat there on the side of Starburst, which will allow them to make what they hope will have to be their final push of the game on their route to a potential knockout. This is huge. You can see immediately there on the top left. That's where the attack came from last time that they weren't able to slow down. This time they were able to get rid of one of those pesky 52 gals in the process. Bran is going to move up. Will they be able to find Q here or will Q hold on? Does get it here and now still some more health is able to get the splash wall out. They are fired Ice is up there, just a few more points. Can Bran get back? Leafy goes to attack and Ice holds it. Ooh. This will be the lead going the other way. Three down, a delayed wipe. They're all moving in. Madness, the last one who can get it, gets taken down. Q gets a double there. Biscuit moving up. Can Biscuit hold? Can Biscuit dance? Not able to. Bagel still there, but Milana with 30 seconds left. It's going to take essentially a knockout if Jackpot is going to pull this miracle off. They certainly are. And you know what? It's going, they're going to really have to pull those specials together. They're going to have to coordinate those Killer Whale 5.1s to be able to know exactly where Starburst is because, you know, this is a pretty safe game for Starburst and they don't really have to move that tower any further than they did. And Zach, that was a very, very early tacticaler there. They know that they are going to have to win essentially two fights. They were going to have to win to take mid. That has been checked off the list there. Another tacticaler down. This checkpoint's going to go very fast here. Crowd makes some noise here. A huge fight. One goes down. They rush the tower and Starburst takes it. Elation as these teammates pop up. Look at them jumping around. <laughs> An incredible game five set, and you could not ask for a better set to start off Splatoon 3. I am honestly shocked. I was convinced as that blaster went down from Biscuit that they were in for a long overtime. But the rest of Starburst came surging back right out of spawn. Ice was able to make use of the range from that heavy splatling, and of course, Bran and Bagel locking things down so well, especially on the 52 going up against two of that same weapon. And as I mentioned, that ever-present tactical farming in Zap. So phenomenal and great teamwork. And let's take a moment back here and talk about the push that got them that lead. You saw that it was sort of a scrum. It was a scrap there around that checkpoint. And immediately you saw Leafy very wisely trying to take tower, understanding that it needed to go down there, but ice as he has done for years with a variety of weapons, dancing around it perfectly, taking out that 52 gal, and giving them the push that they would get the lead with. You know, it really takes a pro with uh, really good movement skills to be able to maneuver around that tower the way that Ice did, and you know, it just shows you that Ice is a pro. And as we wait for our next teams to get set, we'll, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that last set. And so much to talk about here. I want to go all the way back to that Splat Zones game and talk a little bit because Splat Zones, as you noted earlier, Zach, is maybe the most common mode that is played at a competitive level in Splatoon 2. We wondered what that would look like without the displacement specials that are so common that we've been playing with for so many years. What was your take of how the teams played that Splat Zones map early on at Aglefish Market? Well, you know, when thinking about that map, I actually want to allude it to another map, which I believe will be coming back in Splatoon 3, and that is Mako Mart. Mako Mart has kind of a plush-shaped zone, but there are some boxes and some high ground right next to the zone that give pretty much every type of weapon a shot at helping to paint things. We could see Ice getting all the way backed up into the tiniest little nook that was still in the zone, doing whatever he could to make sure it stayed painted. But I also want to mention, too, maybe the most popular sub-weapon in all of Splatoon 2 and 3 is certainly the Suction Bomb. And with that delayed detonation but gigantic relative blast radius, that was another crucial step, not just in Splat Zones, but in the other modes as well for taking turf. And Milana, we'll go ahead and keep on this same thing, that Clam Blitz game. I know it, it seems like it was forever ago, but it was really just a few <laughs> minutes ago. We very rarely see that type of Clam Blitz game go. Oftentimes when we see that, it's a mark of two teams who maybe aren't as confident in it. These two teams, as confident as they come, what was your take on why it took them that long and why we had essentially two whole games of Clam Blitz? You know, I think it's a lot to do with the pressure of just being on a stage as big as this, right? You're, you're, you're gathering those clams and you're like, oh, is it the right time to push? Should I push now? Are my teammates ready? And you want to make sure that everything is perfect before you make that push because otherwise, you know, the other team is going to capitalize on your, your mistakes. I'm getting word from on high that Ashley has another series of fun <laughs> interviews for us here. So everybody, don't go anywhere. Ashley, we'll toss it to you.
Thanks, everybody. I've got Lucia and Jorge here looking very fresh today at PAX West. Did you play the demo? Yes. How did you like it? I loved it. I'm so excited for the ninth. Do you have a special that you're really looking forward to playing? Like, I'm excited for what I'm looking forward to. I'm excited for the story, like the story mode. I'm, I cannot wait to play that. And also new music. I, I am a music fan. I love the music so much. The music in this game is pretty amazing. Uh, deep cut, always ready for a tune. Jorge, did you get a chance to play the game? I play it, yes. I play it for the first time here at the booth. You played Splatoon for the first time ever here at the booth? Yes, I did. <laughs> what did you think of it? Uh, it's, it's great. I, li I love it, yeah. That is amazing. I am super excited for the launch of Splatoon 3. I'm excited to see you online. I can't wait to see you in the shoal. We're going to get our online play together. Thank you so much for talking to us. Enjoy the tournament. Enjoy the rest of PAX. And so heartwarming to see players of all levels competing here as this new game brings veterans and newcomers alike. We have the bracket up here for you. An unbelievable act to follow that Starburst and Jackpot just treated us to. Jackpot putting up the very best, but they will be out now. This is Luz and you are out in the bracket. So Starburst has moved forward and we will now move into Mad Titans versus Super P. We've got the rules up here once again. Going to be a lot the same that you saw last time. Again, if you're just joining us, a best of five, the higher seed will choose the mode and the lower seed will choose the stage. After the first game, the winning team will choose the mode and the losing team will choose the stage. We will have to play all four of the game modes that you see listed there before we can repeat and our stage list over on the side can only be played once until we rotate all the way through. So again, if you are just joining us, you missed one of the best sets that we've ever seen. <laughs> and it also happens to be the first set that we've ever seen here in competitive Splatoon 3. And Milana, again, as we get these teams set up here, how do you follow that sort of act? Their nerves have to be through the roof. Uh, you know what? They might be, but with players as strong as the ones on Super P and on Mad Titans, I don't know. They, they feel like... They got this under control. <laughs> well, I'll ask you a follow-up there because Super P, I think, being a team of, of players that have come together in a pickup here, certainly not as established as some of these others. What does it mean when you are players of that caliber? You maybe don't have the same sort of synergy, but you know that you're just as capable. You know, I think it just comes down to how well you know the game because it, once you have that familiarity with the game, you really could play with anybody. And, you know, all of these players are here to perform at the top and they're here to win. Exactly. And, and Zach, I'll toss the other team to you here. You cannot tell the story of Splatoon 2 without Kyo, the captain of the Mad Titans, an amalgamation of FT Win that dominated this scene for so long. They've come back. They are mad, as you would expect in the name, <laughs> and they want to return to the peak. They're not just mad, they're voracious. Even in the original matches that we saw off screen on the first Turf War game, they were screaming, yelling, hollering callouts at each other. They were pumped up to win just one game at the highest level here because they know they're up against the strongest competition. And even players like Zero, who again, coming back from a relative hiatus and now trying to once again play at the highest level, that is not an easy feat or turnaround to make, especially with new mechanics in the game. Obviously, they've done it brilliantly so far. We will be going to Splat Zones on Undertow Spillway. And this is a very interesting one here. You can see at the bottom here in Splat Zones, you will control a patch of turf after you hold, in this case, two small patches of turf. The timer will start to go down. You want to hold on to it as long as possible. The two teams will trade back and forth. Whoever has the lower score at the end wins if neither team hits zero. Milana, this, I would argue, is maybe the most unique map and mode combination in the game, the way that this plays. We saw Undertow earlier in tower control, totally different in Splat Zones. Definitely. And, you know, I think what makes it really different is, like you mentioned, that two zone territory that you have to control. In, in Splat Zones, usually you have a map that has one, one big Splat Zone, um, but because this one has two, you have to control both of them for a certain amount of time. And if you lose control of one, you don't, you don't get any score. <laughs> We're getting into the game, folks, here. Game one between the Mad Titans and Super P here. Our second set, if it can be even half as good as the first, we will be in for a treat. Taking a look at the comps here, Zach, I see a couple buckets, a couple sloshers, and I know you're a fan. Yeah, big fan of the sloshers here. And it, I think it has a really, really strong kit. But another weapon that I want to touch on is going to be that Splatana Wiper, the only Splatana class variant available to our players today. 
day. It's a great weapon for turf war, and it has kind of an underrated special in that ultra stamp, which allows you to zoom across the map. Leotos, the only player that we really got to see use it here. We said it's a pesky weapon to pin down, and that is exactly how they're going to try to play it. Synapse, one of the very best at this 52 gal, is going to try to retreat back there. They do have three members here trying to attack Synapse, and they're able to hold. Meanwhile, on the other side, the early lead is going to go in favor of the Mad Titans. Pushing up, Token moving up there, zero on the left side. Kill working with them as well. They dive three down, and it looks like they're going to get punished for it. That's a couple going down there from Leotos on that split. Latana Wiper, and now once again, it's Super P's turn, Milana. It certainly is, and you know, we really have to keep an eye on Leotos because with that Splatana Wiper, it really has a lot of, a surprising amount of maneuverability. So to be able to like have that, that player just sharking and watching, you really have to be cognizant of where this player is going. Speaking of quick weapons here, how about it? Zero, Mr. 3K himself <laughs> moving up and attacking there with the Splat Duelies that he made so famous back in the early days of Splatoon 2. Zach, this is a very mobile weapon and it's got a fantastic hit. Diving in there and getting taken out by Synapse again. And we have absolute pandemonium in the center of the map. I have to imagine Duelies feel even better in Splatoon 3. Obviously not when you're taking shots from a 52 straight to the dome, but otherwise gives you a lot of great mobility there as we see Zero taking down Taco. Going to be looking for a second one on the Synapse, and they're going to use the roll of the Splat Duelies to get away, trying to find the third. It'll be a slasher, and they'll find the wipeout. Oh my goodness, absolute domination there from Zero. It's like they never left. Like he never left indeed, and now it's going to be Super P's turn to try to figure out a way. They do have the Tacticaler here from Taco, but where are they going to deploy it? This is important. If you put it too far off to the side, you give up entirely too much ground. And now the Wavebreaker going to do some damage here, and Taco needs to be careful. That's another hit. They finally do get the Tacticaler down out of necessity. But Milana, I think this whole operation took a little too long. I think that, you know, Taco was really waiting for that perfect moment, but sometimes that perfect moment just doesn't come. That you need to be able to kind of think on your feet and, you know, support your teammates in the thick of the action. Thick of the action is right here. There's only 15 seconds left. Synap needs to get this pick and does. They need to try to hold it. Token's going to go down. They're trying as hard as Burt on the backside is going to get another and Kyo is able to get another and he is doing some form of taunt there <laughs> in the center. Just five seconds there. Juan has to move away, but a dominant victory. Really the first that we've seen by the Mad Titans. You can see them clapping, banging their chests and they are ready for this set, Zach. I know, Nine, you were particularly looking forward to hopefully seeing a potential taunt or coincidental <laughs> dance from Juan Kyo, but that was a phenomenal performance, and it shows you how well-rounded this Mad Titan squad is. They, of course, have some of what have be become the staple weapons in Splatoon 3. You have the Enzap. They're not the first team to run something like, you know, a heavy Splatlinger for us to see that, but the way they executed and so unabashed Ashedly rush the zone. Even in the face of something like an Ultra Stamp, they're not scared as we saw Leotos go down with that special in one of the final 30 seconds. And there is one player on the team that we have talked about, Zero, we've talked about Kyo. Burt might be the single most versatile player in this entire tournament. Has a huge roster of weapons. That time we saw it on the Splatling. And as we move into Rainmaker on Hagglefish Market, you can expect to see some different weapons come out of that skid. We definitely can. And you know what? As, as somebody who is experienced with competitive play from Splatoon 2, Burt is probably single-handedly the most uh, supportive player in Splatoon, uh, at least Western Splatoon. And, you know, just, uh, we, I expect that, you know, for Rainmaker, maybe we might see a little bit of a tenth of a while. Yep. We, we did see it earlier in Turf War here, and it's such a strong weapon here as well. It is equipped with that ink vat and a giant shield that you're going to have to get through before you can even touch that ink vat here. But Zach, I want to uh, talk a little bit about Rainmaker here on Hagglefish, because we did not get to see it earlier. How do you anticipate this particular mode playing on this map? You know, I think there is some hope for some shorter range weapons. It is a little bit wider. There are plenty of boxes to go around, if I remember correctly. So that does give you some cover if you're having to play against something like a Slosher or a Heavy Splatling, for example. But you really are going to have to wait and take those picks before you try and initiate a push. We've seen, again, the 52s come out a lot. Those splash walls are going to be tough to get around, and you're really going to have to worry about that pace of play. Rainmaker, make it rain. It says it on the screen here as the teams dive back into the action here. 
As we take a look here at game two, they're coming in. We have some changes, Milana. I'm sorry, are those some Tetra Duelies that I'm seeing from Zero now? And you know what? Zero is kind of sick with it, with those Tetra Duelies. Um, and you know, with that Reef Slider, it really can help you get right into the, the thick of the action. And meanwhile, Juan on the other side has switched over to that Splattershot. Zach, I know you think that this is an incredibly powerful weapon, and Juan, certainly an experienced Kensa Splattershot main from Splatoon 2. You'd expect to see great things from him. I'm a big fan. It just seems to do everything really well. It's a three shot kill. It's got relatively low deviation as we're seeing a couple of pickups there. As the members of Super P are trying to come back here. Leotos gets a frontal shot there with the charged hit from that Splatana Wiper, but they're only just barely going to be able to get stopped in front of that pedestal. Still looking to make a push going forward and they have plenty of room. Leotos absolutely dominating with the Splatana Wiper. We wondered if anyone would be able to make this weapon use and finally the Reign of Terror over here, but not before the first checkpoint falls. And Milana, when you have been pushed back like the members of the Mad Titans are, how do you go about getting some control of the center of the map? You know, you're going to have to send someone like Zero in to get some picks before uh, before you send the rest of the team in. So having a player as strong as Zero, unfortunately... I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Just what? <laughs> I'm, uh, somebody <laughs> had stuck behind them that entire time. It's going to be the first Reef Slider that we see. Some more taunting come out of here. But guys, you do not have the lead yet. They aren't going to let the Rainmaker reset, or rather they're going to try to grab it here. But that gave Super P just enough time. They had snuck a member behind Zach and were able to sneak out just a few more points. Squids are exploding left and right. I can barely keep up with it. We have Bird here on the Rainmaker trying to do what they can to wait until the rest of their members are here, which they are now. Not many specials built up though. On the opposite side, Super P trying to hang on, but they lose their tactical or they're not able to deploy it. Leoto is one of the last members alive and they may have to use his Ultra Stamp to stop this push from Token. Are they going to do it? They're going to opt to let the first checkpoint fall, and you saw the Ultra Stamp go off there, and the Ultra Stamp gets taken out too quickly. That's another one down. Zero is moving through. They have the Tacticooler. Token going to be the Rainmaker Carrier. That's going to be lead, but they want a lot more. Token moving the Reef Slider, working the way, and stopped at just three points, Milana. That was such a close, just this is so close. Uh, you know, Super P is really playing the hardest game, but man, Kyo, almost getting that dunk, still at three points left. It is... Super P is really going to have to be careful. Maybe you, another member of Mad Titans might just squirm by and pick up their Rainmaker. I mean, Mad Titans right now using the very, very tried and true strategy of I'm going to fight you and worry about what comes after, after. Again, two members over there fighting, willing to throw themselves at whatever is. How's about a third? Everybody is attacking. There is no slowdown in this team, Zach. Okay, despite the fact that they just lost two, there is some room for optimism here for Super P. They've already cleared that first platform, so they don't have to worry about it in the future. Even if they make it to overtime, they'll have 60 seconds just to get to the very end pedestal Ooh. as we see a nice double kill there from Burn, who is apparently just guarding the Rainmaker while the rest of their team goes off to the sides. And again, letting the rest of the members jump in a role that's so important for anybody who's an anchor player. The Milana super jumps that we have seen can be so dangerous if you don't have a player calling out where you can do it safely. As yeah, for sure. And you know, being able to be able to super jump right back into the action and you know, as we're talking, so much action is happening. Three down on the side of Super P. Mad Titans is really, really going in for the the win. <laughs> they are. <laughs> and I, I love what you did there with the wordplay there. I heard Zero scream after he got all three of those members from <laughs> up here. Now they're going to try to use a couple specials just to slow it down. That's a tri and I believe that's all three shots with the Rainmaker still being up. Now Leotos very close and now does have that Ultra Stamp. When will they opt to use it here? Trying to pester, trying to identify where the attack is coming from. Does get a hit on the kill. Will they be able to close this out, this fight? All the while going away from the Rainmaker. Everyone is rotated over. It's a part Party here and Leotos not able to get it as Token is able to take that out. Continued fights on this side. Zach continued pandemonium. There is madness on the board. One of the nice things about popping your special is that it actually completely refills your ink gauge on the back of you. So even if you use the entirety of your tank, once you pop that special, <laughs> you're able to get it back. And unfortunately, Atudos here performed jumping into the water with the Rainmaker. Not going to be able to do anything about it, but they are going to kill off some time as we just have 30 seconds left to play. And Milana, this is a really rough spot for that Rainmaker to be a bit of a, you know, you take a swim right there here, but it 
almost works out even better because now they're going to have to take it from that side. So many avenues to attack. They're going to opt to continue to do it here. And again, the continued attack. There was follow-up on top of that as well with just 10 seconds. Nobody left in the center of the map except for Juan. Would have to make a hero play. But as it stands right now, a couple seconds. Will they opt to grab it or let it sit? Three, two, one. And once again, the Mad Titans continue their rampage. They, they certainly are. That was just a, such an impressive we played. There was just so much pressure on Super P from the Mad Titans that they really couldn't get their footing after that first push. And Zach, we talked so much about what we thought this game would look like, what the aggression and engagement heavy style would look like, what it would look like when Tacticooler was something that people were really able to take advantage of. I thought we'd have to wait until, oh, I don't know, release day to see it <laughs> looks like that. What in the world? I honestly cannot remember a time in the most recent Splatoon 2 tournaments where we've had such back and forth play while still having splat after splat after splat. The amount of aggression that we're seeing in these games is really indicative of how it's not just the turf that's important, it's who you're able to take out and win. We saw Leotos unfortunately trying to pop that Ultra Stamp in a last ditch effort and either they were backed into a corner or missed their swipe and were taken down on the back of it. So you really have to be cautious when you're popping that special and where because the Mad Titans, they'll find you. So we do have, it appears to be Tower Control on Mincemeat Metalworks that'll be coming up next year. So again, if you're just joining us, Tower Control, you are going to have to hop up on that tower. It will push towards your opponent's side of the map. You'll have to sit through a couple checkpoints there. But the important thing, Milana, someone's always got to be riding that thing if you want to score. And you know, it couldn't hurt to have a, a couple of your teammates pushing forward, making way for that tower to have that momentum to continue to the, ex the end point. So I'm going to follow up with you here again on, again, because you've been in this position and you've competed at a high level before, you're down 0-2. What are the members of Super B telling themselves right now? How do you pull yourself out of this type of hole and get yourself into game three, game two, or I'm sorry, game four, game five, and so on? I mean, I think it just takes a lot of being able to like reset yourself, reset that mindset. You know, you, you're, you're good players. Everyone here is at the top of their game, top of Splatoon 2, now top of Splatoon 3 that they need to just, you know, kind of reset and, and bring their A game back into the into the action. And, and let's talk a little bit more here about Super P here, because they've now gone over to Tower Control, Zach. And I would say maybe more than any other mode, this is where you will see big, big sweeping changes in compositions come out. This is where the blasters will come out. This is where you'll really try to fit an ink vac weapon into your composition. What do you think Super P might try to pivot over to to get themselves their first win? Well, I think, first of all, for ability-wise, you're going to want to pull on your shoes last ditch, or sorry, stealth jump, and then on your hat, last ditch effort. I think because we've seen Mad Titans so dominantly get to 30 and below on the objective marker, that is going to give them so many more advantages, especially if on their clothing, they're able to pair it with Intensify Action, that new ability, which as you described, Milana, grants you plenty of benefits, exhibited probably not anywhere better than on those blaster style weapons. So, Milana, I'll ask you another question as, again, we get the team set up here to compete. The way that these attacks have come out here from the members of Mad Titans here, because, look, it's one thing to say, let's go in and attack, let's be aggressive, but there's so much more to it than that. It's attacking from one side where you know another member is coming around to attack. How do you go about coordinating that in the heat of the moment? I think it just, it's communication is key, especially for a team game like Splatoon, to be able to pinpoint exactly where you are and what your intentions are, and being able to communicate that with your teammates is just so important. It's so important and so difficult as well, especially with the Tacticooler coming in here. I know we've talked about that special to death, but again, it's so important to note here how much it changes. It does allow you to jump back into the action. It makes you stronger. It allows you to respawn faster as well. And these NZAT players, we talked about it in that last set with Jared. We talked about it with Bagel. And now Token, the member of the... Um, the uh, Mad Titans who's been able to do it this well, it's that much more impressive when you're able to do it here. And building specials, not nearly as easy as it sounds. It certainly isn't. To be able to know, to be able to know exactly where on the map you're going to be and to not like compete with your teammates to turf, I think that is especially important, especially as a support player. Here we go, Super B's final attempt here. They're going to need to win this game and a couple more if they want to bring this back. Leotos immediately switching over to the Charger, and we see 
There it is, Zach. The blaster is out. The Mad Titan Kyo himself is hungry, and we've got a game starting now. We're starting to come away from surprises a little bit on the team compositions. The blasters are obviously quite strong on tower control with that big bubbler. The Enzaps are a staple and a mainstay already, and the 52s with those walls, you can see the way that this map has an upper elevation and a lower elevation. However, lots more broad rooms, so I don't know how much availability and coverage the Killer Whale, uh, or sorry, the wall gives you unless you're on that tower. And a great, great opening there. You saw they immediately attacked the two members that tried to punish them, though, all the while. Token and the other members did a great, great job of making sure that that push couldn't get too dangerous. It actually looks like Super P opted to completely give up the tower there. Go back to mid and hold on a minute. That's another two down. They're going to be moving forward. Synapse, a player whose name we haven't called out that much, you knew eventually going to make his presence felt, Milana. And you know Synapse is one of the best players on the West. As that, that 52 gal is really, really scary. And you know, I think that Mad Titans is going to have, they're going to really have to be, be on the lookout for Synapse. Already, Leotos going with that charger, moving up here. They've got a couple members on there, and there it is. The big bubbler getting pushed up on there. Does get taken out very quickly. But the tactical loo there, I believe. Leotos hit another shot, and now will Tackle be able to find a pick? Does! Very good. A nice opening score. That's that early checkpoint out of the way. Every push at this point will be a little bit easier, Zach. Yeah, you've got a little bit of a preview into the set that we saw here on the heavy spot link. It's mostly going to be run speed, and this is the grading that I was talking about. You can't swim on it, but if you're a weapon like a spot link, it gives you a big advantage here as we see them get an assist onto one. That's going to be a one-down situation, hoping to prevent the members of Super P from even building up any more specials at that point, but they will find at least one pick as both blasters go down. Burt moving across there with that new squid roll. Leotos not able to get that shot. That could really come back to bite them there. Gets that one, though. You're not going to miss twice. And look at this one move back to get Zero, who would make it the mission to take out that charger. Taco going to come back in. Synaps gets it. That's a wipeout. One moving up and a completely different Super P this time around, Milana. We really see that, that teamwork really coming together for Super P. And, you know, like I said, you really have to make sure that your teammates are pushing up in front of that tower. And you see we have a member of Super Super P sitting on that tower, but the rest of them are working hard to, you know, earn their keys. Got to be careful there. You can't fire too hard. They were able to find Bertho. How's about that? A really, really important splat to get. Got to be careful there. They do end up diving there. What a gutsy call to make it there. Zero going to come through in the cleanup, but really, Milana, everybody contributed to that defense. <laughs> they certainly did. Being able to have that communication open and, you know, to be able to know, hey, I'm going to go after XYZ player, player and to be able to, to utilize that. Man, these, uh, these splats are really going back and forth. That killer whale. I think that Zero actually led that into Token. And how's about this? Leotos immediately moving forward. Synapse moving forward as well. Two minutes left. And once again, Zach, it's been Super P that's had multiple good attempts at this push. Yeah, really, they're starting to cycle their specials quite well. Unfortunately, though, if you don't stay alive, that's not going to give you much <laughs> of an advantage as the splat goes down there. And that's going to be three splats and a full wipeout. As Mad Titan says, we don't need the lead, but we'll take it from you with a wipeout on the side. Synapse trying to back off in the midst of two differing color splash walls here. And unfortunately for them, they're not even going to need them. That They're going to get that help from the rest of the members of Super P. And that teamwork is exactly what they're going to need if they want to win this match. That fight took a lot of time there. So much so that everybody had to rotate over. And that allowed them to get through that first checkpoint. They do clear the tower here, but the threat is not yet gone. With Zero going down, though, it might be. And Taco and Synapse once again moving through. The blasters will go. It's a delayed wipeout this time. And once again, the members of Super P in in control. Just one minute left, Milana. It really feels like they've hit their stride. They certainly have. And just being able to, to get those picks, Lyra's getting uh, some really nice flats on, on Mad Titans and giving that space to be able to have their team move up with them has been, you know, chef's kiss. And, and Zach, on the defensive side too, that's what's really impressed me with Super P. It's another incredible <laughs> shot. That's a huge offensive player going down. That's another one going down here, but hold on. Two more on the other side. It's just Leotos going to opt to jump out and is not able to get out. Token closes it out. And look at this. Zero jumped in. Kyo jumped in. Zach, they're all in offensive position. No lag on that one. That was the very last possible shot taking down not just the charger, but also the ink back that was charged along with that. That's going to be 60 for the 
the members of Jackpot, but will Matt Titans be able to reclaim it? They're going to take out the Charger, and that is going to be the lead. On top of it, they're also going to find a wipeout. The members of Super VR are going to have any specials at their disposal. And on top of that, Matt Titans is going to be deploying that massive uh, Killer Whale 5.1 that's going to give them even more of an advantage at range. The snowball is starting to get bigger and bigger. They've attacked, and that's going to be it as the Mad Titans will get the 3-0 victory. It took him a little minute to figure it out in that last game. The members of Super P adapted incredibly well, and for the bulk of that game, they gave it their very best, but the Mad Titans rampage is not done yet. Making sure that they don't lose their cool is, you know, honestly, something that Mad Titans is incredibly good at, to be able to make those calm pushes back. And you know, they only had like 30 seconds left on the clock, to be able to have that have that calm level headedness, level headedness. I guess <laughs> I, I'm like having trouble talking. <laughs> There's just too much Splatoon happening. <laughs> there is a lot of Splatoon, and it's all been great. Let's go ahead and recap our action here. Let's take a look at the bracket because we have our final teams and. A round of applause here for all of our competitors. Super P and Jackpot will be on the sidelines watching the finals. But Zach, Starburst, the Mad Titans, an amalgamation of the same rivalry we've been watching for so, so long. I was going to mention literal years these players have been going back and forth and sometimes have joined forces with each other in order to play. But today they are vying for the top spot in a game that is coming out so, so soon from today. It's going to be just a few more days. And with us now having seen how the ranked modes work out and how chaotic they could be, I can't imagine how excited the folks are to get this game in their hands. We're going to throw it back to Ashley here for another interview. Don't go anywhere, everybody. Grand Finals right around the corner. Thanks, everybody. I'm down on the show floor at PAX with Carrie and Luke. Are you having fun today? Yes. Are you enjoying the tournament? Yes. What is your favorite part of Splatoon 3? What's your favorite weapon you've played so far? Trash Stringer. Oh, the bow, huh? Did you get a lot of splats? Not really. Not really? I think you're going to get really good at Splatoon 3. Are you going to watch the teams play today and get some tips? Yeah. I love it. Mom, tell me a little bit about what is so fun for Splatoon for you as a mom. As a mom? Well, I got to watch him and his sister play, and it's not blood and gore, which is great. It's just good paintball fun, and that's what I enjoyed. And I enjoyed watching him play with, obviously, people older than him and beating them. That was exciting. Yeah, that's always the best, right? When you get to get that really cool splat in, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, Luke and Carrie, thank you so much for talking to me.
We'll pull up a chair because the table's set for grand finals here at the Splatoon 3. Enter the Splatlands Invitational 2022. Two of the top teams here getting set for a best of seven. And let's go ahead and check out the bracket. We had some furious semifinal action in which we saw one round go to five games. The other was a sweep, but that'll bring us to Starburst versus Mad Titans. If you thought Seahawks Niners was a rivalry, just hang on here for a second and let's go ahead and check out the rules for the finals as we get set because this will go by a little bit different set. We've got a few more maps joining it. Obviously the higher seed will choose the mode, lower seed will choose the stage, and after the first game, the winning team will choose the mode, the losing team will choose the stage. It's all on the board, folks. Clam Blitz, Splat Zone, Tower Control, Rainmaker. But now we have added Mahi Mahi Resort and Museum de Alfonsino, and we are getting set here, Nine, for Splat Zones in the museum. And what do you make about this map, first of all, as we get set? Well, there's a lot of familiarity. This is a map that has been slightly changed, but that we have been playing since Splatoon 1, and this was maybe the most popular map and mode combination Back in those days, the players know how to get back into the center of the map. They know how they're going to want to attack when the lockout phase starts. And more than anything, they're going to be very, very confident. Looking at this matchup, let's go ahead and start with the Mad Titans here. We just saw them sweep their way through semifinals here, Zach. What stood out to you about their performance? How dominating it was. And really, there was so much talk going into these ranked modes about aggression is going to be key. Keeping up the pace of play and not giving an inch is going to be key. And they really did such a phenomenal job of that. And I'm sure they will in these grand finals. All right, we are set to go. Splat zones between Starburst and Mad Titans. First team to four wins will claim the championship. Nine, go ahead and get us started with this loadout here. Well, immediately you can take a look at Bert, who has switched back over to that tent umbrella. This thing was absolutely ferocious in scrims, and the fact that he's opted to pull it out right now tells you that this is the weapon he's been hiding all along. Bagel already hydrating the teammates with that tactic cooler. Zone is claimed early on, and already what we see is the aggression from the beginning, Zach. Yeah, not just that. We're going to see sort of a metered style of play where they focus on, as we see here, the triple ink strike to give them that passive ink come as we have the zone around two that will give them a bit of maneuverability for their other mobile weapon, the Splat Duelies, which will give them a shot to use the Crab Tank and do a lot of damage on both of its firing modes. Starburst still with the lead, controlling the zone. Here's Kyo having to go ahead and super jump out of here, Nine, and all of a sudden they have the Mad Titans on their heels. Yeah, they have not gotten a foothold this entire time. Both Token and Zero maybe a little bit antsy here, trying to get into fights and have gone down very, very early. I don't know that either one of them has even gotten a special off after the initial tactic cooler. Meanwhile, Biscuit going to go ahead and get a punish. Zero is going to get the revenge at least. But Zach, they need to find themselves a little bit of zone here. Yeah, this is going to be so difficult now to defend because Ice is on that heavy splatling, and that is a weapon that loves to have as open of a field as possible to make use of that run speed and also to build up that wave breaker, which this is a great map to use it on because other than the, mo the rotating platform in mid, it's relatively flat. They're not even going to need it. What a rollover. Blinked and you missed it. How about that juicy performance by Starburst? I mean, unbelievable the way that they worked through that. And I said at the start that I thought these teams would be confident once the lockout phase had started, how they were going to move over. It seems like Mad Titans never really were able to coordinate how they wanted to come back in. You saw Bert on the Tentabrella was working on the left side. Kill went over there. Where was Token? Where was Zero? They weren't able to make it work in the same way they were that last set. And that's what's surprising, Zach, is that you can go ahead and claim the zone that early, but then to lock them out the entire game that is some top tier stuff right you know there. you oftentimes see your anchor players on museum delfonso you know play on top of that platform it gives you such great visibility but when you have that much of the zone covered there's really no need to be so bashful the heavy splatling doesn't even have quite as long of range as some of your other anchor options like the hydra splatling and some of your longer range chargers so really it was smart of ice to know pushing up using that cylinder in the middle as a sort of defensive shield and to play around that while throwing the wave breaker was too much much for the members of Mad Titans to push back in. And Nine, you look at the Mad Titans, they swept their way through semifinals. Starburst, it took them five games. Starburst to deliver that kind of message on their first at bat, that has to go a long way towards their confidence. It really does. And after the set that they just had, they have to be confident that they can handle anything that anybody throws at them. The one thing that I will say in the Mad Titans' favor here is that this is a team that is geared to play on the tower controls, on the Rainmaker. They are going to attack, and on that map and mode in particular, you saw it's not so easy when the zone is that wide. Nine, I appreciate the alley-oop for the segue because we have tower control at Eeltail Alley and Zach. 
This combination here, this is one, as Nine said, Mad Titans feel very comfortable with. Yeah, this one is not very easy to make your pushes through. They have that pretty long bridge over top of the map, but the big bubblers we've seen with tower control will continue to be one of the best specials that you can run, and I would imagine that they'll at least have one each here. Let's rack it up again. Tower control, eel tail alley. We'll see if the Mad Titans can bounce back after getting dominated by Starburst in the first game. Here we go, game two of our finals. Mad dash to the middle. Anything you see off the top here, Nine? I mean, the Blasters, these might be the two best Blaster players to ever come out of North America. And they used to be teammates. Biscuit and Kyo, they're going to put on a show. Tacticooler ready to go on the onset. Go ahead and help your teammates get juiced up. Bagel moving forward. Both teams four on the map. Bagel trying to move forward. Numbers advantage right now. Here comes another little wave and already nine they've done a great job of getting out to mid and establishing a little bit of control yeah i think they've done a much better job here and i think that zero moving over to the 52 gal is a big reason for that there's a lot more survivability with that weapon than there were with the duelies as i say that does get taken out ice is going to trade with kill here now again token going to go down it's pandemonium in the center with bert being the last member of the mad titans with anything to say and mad titans a really nice stand there zach yeah, I think the tactical, as you can see, it's right in the middle of the map. Not only is it invulnerable, but for the other team, it's kind of a homing beacon. You know exactly where the other team is going to group up when that tactical is active, so you can hone in on that spot and get a couple of quick splats if you're fast enough. Here's Bagel once again setting up that cooler, and they get to the checkpoint here, and they're making quick work of a nine. I mean, a wipeout right there again. The Mad Titans just don't seem to be able to coordinate any attack, and this might be virtue of not having the backliner there. Ice has been really unimpeded this entire time. Now, it's just Bert who is actually going to get taken down. The Tentabrella was able to go out, but look at this. Bran attacking, zero diving. It's a delayed wipeout, and uh... Ice has what? no intention of chilling out, and just like that, Starburst. 2-0, smacking him in the face and getting rolling here, Zach. So you take the analogy that I had on Museum D'Alfonsino, right? You have ice on the heavy splatling, hiding behind a cylinder. Now shrink that cylinder about 10 or 15 times. That's what's in the <laughs> middle of your tower and is practically your only defense when you don't have a big bubbler up. Ice was able to use and maneuver around that space in order to both act as a distraction, a jumping point, and a slayer to finish off that match. And really that versatility from Ice is what's incredible here, Nine, because not only are you helping your team move objective, but you're also helping out all of your teammates as far as having that numbers advantage. Yeah, and I think it's the one thing, again, that they have over the Mad Titans. In the sense they do have a true backline player there, it makes it that much easier when you do have to defend, not that they've had to do a lot of that, but you also know that the opponent's not going to have that resource. They're going to have to be much, much more honest when they try to take the tower. And as you saw, honesty ain't cutting it right now. No, it is not. So the Mad Titans need to figure something out here. We'll have Rainmaker coming up next here on Scorch Gorge, Zach. And so what is the difference? What is the change the Mad Titans need to be? Because Starburst is just trying to take all the drama out of the finals right now. They just want to get to Ford, get their trophy, and get on out of here. So this is actually a map and mode combination I believe we've seen before. There are a couple of Rainmaker free modes on the opposite sides of the map, so it's really going to be truncated even further than you think it is. There's a Rainmaker pop in the center of the map, which is on a raised pedestal, and normally that's going to be pretty difficult to defend, but we saw in that first Rainmaker map and mode, once they get to those checkpoints that are on either, I believe, your left or right side, it really opens up the possibilities and the sight lines for your team. And that's going to be fascinating here, Nine, because you mentioned Mad Titans not playing with a true backliner, and now you look at all the ways that you can look at things on the map and all the sight lines that you have, how is that going to impact their loadout? Yeah, I mean, Scourge Gorge here, again, the losing team did get to pick the map on this, mm -hmm. so this is the Mad Titans going here. Uh, this is a really wide open map. There's a lot of grades here. This is going to be Ice's playground. So the fact that they've opted to come here, I think, means they are hoping that that extra room to maneuver is going to allow them to attack. And this is a must win for the Mad Titans. You do not want to go down 3-0 in a best of seven. So we'll see if the Mad Titans can grab an Infinity Stone and try and figure something out here, Zach. But right now... Here it is. Here are the loadouts. Anything you see differently from the Mad Titans? I'm hearing some cheering, and it could be potentially for Zero's return to those Dark Tetra Duelies, which is going to be the Auto Bomb and Reef Slider as the kit. The Reef Slider, it moves in a straight path, but it's also able to be canceled early, so it can do a big area of effect bit of damage. Can Starburst, the four seed coming into this tournament, the underdog, continue? 
to dominate. We'll find out. Already, Rainmaker grabbed here by Starburst. And it's been these early starts nine that have set the tone. And I mean, just look at the way that they did that there. Ice was leading the charge as the backliner there. They got center, they got the Rainmaker, and they went over there. Now credit the members of the Mad Titans. They were able to rotate over here and minimize some of the damage. But all the while, Biscuit's still maneuvering there and gets the shot onto Token. Incredible. This is attack is going to continue. They've rotated again, and Biscuit has now once again hit Burt. If Burt goes down here, that's the, really their best defensive resource. They're moving this forward here. These last few points so difficult to get. And Zach, we just saw Biscuit mow the lawn and obviously make some way for their team. At this point now already, you see Starburst getting the Mad Titans on the back foot. How do Mad Titans respond here? Well, they have to use that canopy more. That canopy is almost like a, a light to a mosquito or a bug where it just attracts all the attention. And speaking of attracting, we see the ink vac come out, which is bringing all of the ink into their person on top of the triple ink strike, which who would have thought that a slosher would be played in the grand finals of this tournament with its kit? Mad Titans trying to find a little bit of momentum. Right now it has been all Starburst in this third game, just under 3.30 left to go. And right now you see the Killer Whale 5.1 coming out of pair of them here, nine. And at this point, for the Mad Titans, you mentioned it, they can't get that collective push. No, they can't. They haven't even gotten the Rainmaker to reset yet. Every time that that's a bit mad to happen, they've opted to try to fight instead. Now, thankfully and mercifully, the bomb is going to go off of the splash wall and take out Brand, so the threat is gone. They finally do have mid, but that took two specials just to get this. Opportunity here for the Mad Titans to finally move the Rainmaker. They wait for the tent to cooler to pop up before they get a chance, and still, same issue, Zach. Just the oppressive force that we're seeing from Starburst. Yeah, we haven't seen Kyo doing any dancing on this one, despite plenty of opportunities with those triple ink strikes that they've been building like crazy. We also, I don't think, have seen the Reef Slider do a ton, as we see Zero pop it up there in combination with that triple ink strike. So really, that does take away a lot of map. I cannot believe that a kill even came out of that. Unfortunately, it's going to be a trade, and Mad Titans may finally have an opportunity to push. However, Token going to be the last one alive. They're dancing around the Rainmaker Free Zone. I don't know how they haven't gone down yet, but finally they will fall. The music ends for Token, and at this point for Starburst, it's just a matter of continuing to control the momentum here, Nine. And at this point, you've got the lead. What are you looking to do with over two minutes left? You're looking to keep doing the exact same thing you've been doing. Control mid. You know that you want ice at that exact spot. I know that engagement didn't go the way they wanted, but that is the power position. You rotate everybody else over to attack. You sneak the Rainmaker behind ice there, and you wait and see what happens next. 3-3 three, three on the map. You see the Tentabrella making its way towards the Rainmaker. Kyo trying to back up. Kyo just getting forced back. And Zach, again, the ability to have the Rainmaker and push the opposition back. That could have been a sweet little play there, but unfortunately, Kyo getting spotted out. However, they do have the advantage of the Tacticaler, and they're going to use that to their advantage. Falling from a large height, that's going to be a three-down situation with only, I believe, the 52 gal remaining. They're going to use that splash wall, uh, or bomb rather, to break the wall and try and shoot over this wall here in mid, which is one of the things the Slosher does absolutely best. Kyo and company are going to have to work quickly here because under a minute and a half left, they are yet to get on the board here. 4-3 advantage. You imagine this is where the push comes, Nine. Yeah, you take a look right there. Bursty has the ink bath there. They're going to try to set it up. Bert moving forward there. When is it going to be used there? How are they going to do this? Yeah, let's load up on the tactic cooler. If they can stick around and get through this, this might be the big thing. Zero's pushed up. Where are the attackers coming from? That's two down. They're going to have to get this first checkpoint. You have to imagine they'll get it, but no, wait a minute. Biscuit went ahead and got that. Now Bagel attacking. Now it's Biscuit over, and suddenly the walls have come down on this push. And Biscuit just baking everybody and putting a stop to that push, and all of a sudden Starburst in full control. Zach, they're looking to close this out what's the key you want to think about the aim that you have with intensify action here the key is being able to give your blaster room to continue doing what they've already been doing and the big bubbler is going to play a big role in that if they can deploy it they're trying not to do so trying to peek over that canopy and they're able somehow to get bursty there zero also going to fall somehow dodging out of the way and staying alive however they will finally fall and it'll be roughly a 2v2 in the last 10 seconds all hail biscuit just dominating this game with under five seconds left mad titans are going to have to be perfect to close this out 4-4 four, four on the map a couple of specials ready to go for starboard can the mad titans make something of it they still have to get through that first checkpoint time is ticking on overtime Tactic Cooler's out. Burt trying to push forward with that Rainmaker. Here comes the Reef Slider, and that will do it. Starburst 3-0 lead.
dominant nine. I will say it again. The message they have sent and the way they have done things so decisively, this is unbelievable here in finals. It is. The way that this team has adapted and played to their strengths and how quickly they figured everything out from the very get-go of that game, you saw immediately what their plan was. We're going to have Ice go on the grading on the left side. If we push the Rainmaker, we'll push it there, and we'll let Brandon Biscuit go to the right. They did that every single time that they wanted to try to make their push. There was so much pressure, and the defensive side wasn't too shabby either. And we've talked about it, Zach. This is a game in Splatoon 3 that's going to force a lot of one-on-one -on -one situations, maybe 2v1s. Biscuit's ability to win the majority of those and really just snatching the momentum from the Mad Titans was the difference. Look, Blasters are just not known for their mobility traditionally, and the fact that Intensify Action can be paired with things like Swim Speed in order to give you that much more of an advantage and more dodging capability allows you to take on these weapons like the Camo Tentabrella, or the Tentabrella rather, that has this gigantic canopy. How are you supposed to beat that with any normal weapon? Very, very difficult. You have to go around on the flank. For Blasters, they can can just peek out over the top or on the sides and get that chip damage, making it enough to take a, a knockout or a splat from a safe distance. Nine will have Clam Blitz on Hagglefish Market. Obviously, this might be the last stand for the Mad Titans. How do they make sure these finals continue? Well, the first thing you have to do is not take bad engagements, mm. especially in those first two games. I really felt like the members of the Mad Titans were moving up and attacking when they didn't necessarily need to. And the way that Starburst plays, it's so difficult. You may be able to take one out, but if you take too much damage, someone's rotating over and getting you. You know, Ice always has his eyes on the action here, and it's going to be even stronger here in Clam Blitz. Don't take bad engagements. Advice for Splatoon 3 and life as well too. Here we go. <laughs> Clam Blitz, Hagglefish Market. Will Starburst have a notable sweep of such a dominant team or will a legendary comeback begin here with a victory by the Mad Titans and as they make their way towards the middle. What did we learn last time, Zach, from Clam Blitz when you look at some of these specific loadouts? Well, sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures, and we see Zero returning to an old favorite into Splattershot. Again, it has that three-shot uh, splat potential, and is also going to provide you with the Trizuka, which you have to be fast with, but as you can see there, it can at the very least back off your uh, counterparts there and back off the enemy in order for you to pick up some of those clams, which are precious commodities in mid. Mad Titans have yet to control a game from the onset. It's been Starburst fast out of the blocks, but right now, Nine, it does feel like Mad Titans are being the aggressor. Yeah, look at this here, the maneuverability. This is what Comfort will do for you, but hold on a moment. It's Ice. Yes, it's a wipeout. It should be an opportunity for them to push. Can they coordinate it, though? The other members will have respawned in time, and we aren't going to have to wait five minutes for a score this time. Token with the completion. Now let's see who else is coming to the clam bank here, trying to get some more clams in that basket, but already 25 points on the initial push. Make that 26 here, Zach. That's the start the Mad Titans were looking for. You have to love the goofy music that plays when that barrier breaks. It's so fun to watch, but when that barrier goes back up, the enemy team is given a power clam to work with for free. On top of that, they're going to pick up a tactical earth. That's a phrase we haven't said all day, and something will have to give here as we see Ink Strike, Big Bubblers all getting deployed here in this next battle. Biscuit once again picking up the 1v1 splat against Kyo, and that's been the difference maker, Nine. It really has, and look at this. Brand is moving forward here. What are they even firing at? There's not much left. Zero comes in and gets the punishment and gets Brand as well for good measure. The killer whale is out, so they'll have to be careful not to give him any free extra credit, but that could have gotten ugly in a hurry if he hadn't stepped in. Hit in the backfield, but he gets the pass off, so now it's a six-point lead for the Mad Titans. Both teams, slight penalty, and that makes a big difference here, Zach because now you're going to have to have a few more clams join you with that power clam. Yeah, both teams are already working off of a very small pool of clams, so that mid area once again is going to be the contentious zone because you have to find some of the clams that are available to only a select few. A 2v2 situation now is yet again we see the Killer Whale 5.1 come out, Burt making fantastic use of that new squid roll, and also the Wave Breaker at the ready here going to provide some valuable intel if they can set it up correctly. Burt doing a solid job of providing some backline support as well, too, for the Mad Titans. That's what's been missing these last couple of games, Nine. Yeah, this is a stabilizing force. We said earlier there that switching over to that Tentabrella would fit the way they wanted to play, but maybe what they needed was a little stability. Kyo needs to clean this up without going down and does. Look at this, though. It's Biscuit here. They've got two members, and get him! Biscuit finally goes down without taking somebody with them here, and now mid going back to the Mad Titans. Mad Titans in control of the map. Just over two minutes left to go. Burt with the power clam, and at this point, 
you feel like, Zach, that Mad Titans are getting back on the same page. Yeah, they're starting to come back to basics here. First, their anchor player is going to be the one controlling the power claim. That's going to give the rest of their team the best possible opportunity to push forward here. The triple ink strike basically laid at the feet is going to allow them for a trade. It's a 3v3, now 3v2 situation. Make that 2v2 as Bagel will fall. And now, despite holding onto the power claim, Ice will not be shy, able to find one as well. But Burt, looking for the 1v1 duel, we still have not seen much momentum, and that's pretty consistent with the last couple of Clam Blitz battles we've seen. Anybody's game still. Don't forget, Starburst, one more game. They claim this championship. Mad Titans trying to stay alive. Here we go. Starburst at this point, nine. They're the ones that really feel like, other than that initial push, haven't had a chance to be too aggressive. No, the stabilizing force is big, and Ice going down there, also big. Bagel is pushed up there. Token's going to try to jump down on top, but they got Kyo in the scrum of all of that. They're going to rotate back here. The power clam might break. No, Brand does get to it here. They're going to shuffle it around. They finally have it in Ice's hands, which is where they want. With one minute left, that's a huge pick on the Burt. And look at that 18-0 to clam advantage. They dominate all the currency at this point, Zach. And this is going to be massive. That's a three-down oh, situation. This Ice and Bagel are going to push forward. Do it. That's going to break this it. They're going to take the lead easily. It. They put up the tactic cooler right in front of the barricade. Brand hiding with four halfway to another power clam. They will unfortunately fall. Bagel somehow still staying alive, at least for the moment. They will lose the 1v1, and there will be some time here for Mad Titans to make their defiant stand. Starburst, under 30 seconds left from the championship. Can they hold on? Mad Titans, one more push left. Nine, it's going to take everything for the Mad Titans. It is. They do have that pity clam back there at the start, the power clam that comes up. So they will at least get into overtime here. You can see they're firing around the map to build some special. Zero goes down to the auto bomb. The lack of mobility on the Trizuka set him up there to fail. Can they hold mid? Desperately need to not get rushed down at this point. They have the tactical so they'll have a little breathing room. You can see Kyo waiting for Zero to come back. Zero is back there. Keep an eye on the top of the screen. Not much time left in overtime. Can Starburst do it? Can they shock the world? Trying to move forward. Down goes Mad Titans and that will do it. Starburst started from the bottom. Now we at the top. They are your champions. The point of the Splatana at their nape, and they don't flinch one bit, bringing it all the way back in the semis and finding the strength to not only win a map five scenario, but to sweep through a team that has otherwise looked emphatic in this tournament. Well done to a very strong and established team. They're certainly one to watch out for. And nine, it just speaks volumes to just how diverse the talent pool is and the fact that they were able to get through semifinals. It came down to game five against Jackpot, and then they step into finals and get the brooms with the sweep over the Mad Titans. One of the most impressive performances we've seen in a long time. Absolutely, and a round of applause coming out here from the crowd. These are teams and players that have played against each other for years in so many different configurations, and it says so much, the composure to be able to not only win that situation, as you said, but continue it running. Once Starburst hit their stride, the confidence started to come, and they never looked back. And, and Zach, it was overwhelming as far as their starts in the first three games as well, too. I mean, they really just took control of the game, of the objective, and never let go. There's a little bit more of a battle in the fourth one, but unbelievable. Yeah, you really have to be impressed by how adaptive these teams have been. You know, as far as Splatoon 3 is considered, they've had an even amount of time with the game, and they haven't had very much time at all with any of these four modes, having to deal with the changes in Rainmaker or the differences to Clam Blitz. It is a marvel that they were able to pick that up so quickly, find the comp that maybe isn't perfect, but works for each of their team members, and use that all the way to the very end, pulling off the sweep. Let's go ahead and check out the bracket one last time as Starburst, in dominant fashion, sweeps the Mad Titans in finals. They will be your champions of the Splatoon 3 Enter the Splatlands Invitational 2022. And Nine, what does this just say about the greater competitive scene in North America? I mean, again, if this is what the beginning of this looks like, we are going to be treated to an incredible few years of this game here. At the highest stage, with the highest stakes, we see the best type of play. And more than anything, I think it's an incredible reminder that a team like Starburst that has been at the top of Splatoon 2 so long will not be skipping a beat and continuing their reign of dominance.
So the championship moment here, Starburst, as we said before, just unbelievable what they did. 4-0, it's a performance we will always talk about. They will go ahead and claim their championship trophy here. The Splatoon 3, enter the Splatlands Invitational 2022. Hold up that hardware, fellas. You've done an unbelievable job with what you've done. Your first ever champions here in a Splatoon 3 competitive event, and Zach, you just love to see it. I think this is a telltale sign that North America is not to be trifled with when it comes to Splatoon 3. We have not yet gotten to see much in terms of the other regions and how they play and what they will define as meta. And of course, there are still plenty of weapons that have not been released yet. But North America is a dearth Hey, just wealthy with talent, and I'm so excited to see what old and new talent gets cultivated in the first few months of this game. And for both of you, I know this has been a special weekend for sure, as far as getting a chance to get your hands on this Platoon 3. Your thoughts as we get set for that September 9th release date. Oh my goodness. I mean, just <laughs> coming from this and then falling back down to having to wait for just a couple more days, it's going to be difficult. But Thinking about how Splatoon 2 changed from that very first tournament that we saw all those years ago to what it looked like at the end, it's going to be an incredible few years of what this game looks like as we learn, as we develop, and it's going to be a wild ride every second. And Zach, your thoughts as we get set to super jump out of here? It's so close, and I promise you the wait is worth it. It really is such a fun game. There's so much in terms of future updates and development that are in the plans and in the works. So many new features. I personally can't wait for table turf battles. I think that's going to be a super fun addition to the game. I know a lot of folks are interested in Salmon Run. This is just one aspect of a very, very rich game. And I'm sure everyone, including myself, can't wait to dive into it on September 9th. That'll do it for our broadcast. Shout out to our incredible crowd here at PAX West. It was great seeing everybody in person once again. Also, our terrific crew in the back. They absolutely knocked it out of the park. For myself, Nine, Zach, Milana, and Ashley, we appreciate you joining us. Splatoon 3 drops September 9th. In the meantime, make sure you keep it tuned in to Nintendo Versus for all of your competitive Nintendo action. We out!